and Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material personal interest and conflict of interest where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Are there any apologies? Councillor Allen. I advise that Councillor McLaughlin and Councillor Owen will be absent today and I move that they be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. I have, uh, I have a motion moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Marks, that Councillors McLaughlin and Owen be granted leave, a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,588th meeting held on Tuesday, the 7th of May 2019, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Marks, the minutes of the 4,588th meeting of Council held on the 7th of May 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Today we have uh, public participation from Ms Hallie Anderson, Ms Topeka Bugawada and Ms Chloe Kiprios, who will address the Chamber on how Council can prevent plastic pollution in Brisbane. Billy. Welcome to the Brisbane City Council Chamber. Um, you have five minutes. Proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon, Mr Chairman, Lord Mayor and Councillors. Hi, I'm Chloe. I'm Deepika. And I'm Hallie. And, and together we're P Cubed. Plastic. Pollution. Preventers. The plastic crisis on our beaches was really highlighted to us during the Easter holidays when my family and I travelled to Fraser Island. It was heartbreaking to see so much plastic pollution on these beautiful beaches. We collected 11 big bags full of plastic pollution. Did you know that according to the United Nations, 8 million tonnes of plastic is discarded into the world's ocean each year? Also, Greenpeace and National Geographic estimate that 97% of plastic ever made still exists. Can you believe it? We represent Good News Lutheran School at Middle Park. We are passionate about saving our planet and specifically we are committed to helping save our environment from plastic pollution. We want to make a difference in the society we live in today by joining the fight against plastic pollution and inspiring others to do the same. We appreciate the efforts that the Brisbane City Council have made to reduce the reliance of plastic straws and single-use plastic bottles at all council-run events. We are here today to seek your support to promote, to promote further reduction of single-use plastics within our community. In 2018, we entered a competition called the Search for the Next Tech Girl Superheroes. This is a STEM competition specifically for girls in Australia and New Zealand to build an app based on a problem on their local community. We had to design an app, a business plan, a pitch video and an app demo video. We put many, many hours of work into making our P-Cubed app able to educate young Queenslanders aged 12 to 17. It is fun and easy to use and raises awareness of the need to reduce the consumption of single-use plastics. Our app led to us being announced as the National Primary School winners for 2018. We are very excited by this. In August this year, we will travel to the USA to represent Brisbane and Australia at the World Technovation Competition in San Francisco. We will be pitching our app idea to tech giants in Silicon Valley. Our app is now available on Google Play. We have also launched our website and we are active on social media. 
spreading our passion to make a difference to school-age students in order to encourage them to reduce their single-use plastic footprint. We have become more involved in environmental projects in our own community, particularly through the Tangaluma Eco Marines. When we participated in Clean Up Australia Day, we were horrified at the vast number of plastic cutlery that was collected. We are very concerned with the quantity of plastic in our own city that could be easily solved by banning single-use plastics in takeaways and cafes. In March 2019, the European Union announced a ban on single-use plastic by 2021. Hobart City Council also passed a bylaw in March that would see single-use plastics banned in all takeaway ca places and cafes by 2020. We would like to see the Brisbane City Council follow this lead. We would like to propose that the Brisbane City Council introduces a bylaw to phase out single-use plastics cut cutlery in takeaway places and cafes in Brisbane over the next two years. Our ultimate vision would be to expand this to include the ban of, of all single-use plastics in favour of compostable and reusable alternatives. Phasing out single-use plastics will have direct benefits for the Brisbane City Council waste management system. The World Economic Forum calculates that phasing out single-use plastic lessens the plastic burden placed on the waste management systems and is estimated to lower the plastic waste generation by 57%. As Brisbane is a river city, we should be leading the way in prevention of plastic pollution that's ending up in our waterways and ultimately in our oceans. If we can succeed at stopping the consumption of plastic that goes into our waterways and oceans from an early age, we will have a significant impact on our environment and we will be actively creating a solution to this global problem. Thank you for taking the time today to listen to our story and we hope that you share our passion for helping to save the planet from the plastic crisis. And together we can make a difference! Well done. Can I invite the Deputy Mayor to respond, please? Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Hallie, Deprica and Chloe, coming in this morning, can I say, or this afternoon. First of all, can I say congratulations on that speech? It's definitely one of the most enthusiastic we've had in here for a long time. And uh, probably even more so, congratulations on being the 2018 National Award winners for Next Tech Girl Superheroes. That is absolutely fantastic. So particularly when you are competing against girls as old as 17, uh, you have done an absolutely outstanding job and something you should be very proud of. Now, we understand that you've been working with a mentor and you've been taken 12 weeks to identify your problem and how you're going to do the app. And it's very exciting to hear that it's on Google Play already. So we need to talk to you, first of all, how we can promote that a little bit more so people get to know about that. But I have seen your video that you uh, produced to pitch your app as well. So you've made some excellent points in that video. Video, and I hope that's going to go far for you when you get to Silicon Valley later in the year. And happy to talk to you about some of the ways, along with Councillor Howard, um, that we may be able to swap plastics with something more environmentally friendly. So you may know already in council we've made changes about um, single-use practices at our council um, and our uh, events that we have control over, such as straws, helium balloons, plastic bottles and water bottles. I'm happy to talk to you about the process around you, where you change legislation for single-use practice. That's a little bit bigger than council. Um, but we do definitely work on education programs and things like that. And I think one way to do that would be promote your app so we can get more young people like yourself so enthusiastic about making sure that they're looking after the environment. We also launch, launched a reusable cup campaign as well. So hopefully there's a few less workers in the city at least using takeaway cups when they're having their coffee. They get to bring their own. And also we've worked with cafes to give uh, free refusable cups to as a gift to their loyalty customers. So what I would like to say is very well done. We work a lot with new, uh, young people trying to make new apps as well. And as I said, we'd like to take that opportunity to talk to you about we can help promote your app um, through council, even though it's already on Google Play, which is probably far more successful than getting onto the council website, I can say, just quite um, that we do work with a lot of people through our Innovation Lab on their new app. So happy to have a chat with you after this and talk about how we can uh, do some more stuff in Council and the next steps you can take to make sure that you are definitely the international tech superheroes. Well done, girls. Thank you for coming today. Well done. Thank you for coming in.
All right, we have a, a further public participant. I'd like to call on Mr. Frank Meckler, who will address the Chamber on an anti-bullying program for local schools to promote harmony in the community. I also believe that uh, there's material that either has been um, distributed or will be distributed to support Mr. Meckler's um, point. Whichever is more comfortable for you. No, whichever you prefer. Um, Mr Meckler, you have five minutes. Please right. proceed. Thank you, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor, councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to come and have a chat with you today about uh, the effects of bullying in our society. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about AMADA, which is the Australian Martial Arts Youth Development Alliance, which is a very unique organisation that has been formed as a partnership between Jeff Horn, former school teacher and world boxing champion who got into boxing because of bullying, Glenn Rushton, many know Glenn as uh, Jeff's mentor and coach, however, he's also a world ranked karate master, a hand to hand combat expert, and has trained many of the military and police and has trained thousands of uh, thousands of young uh, students. Myself, as a master sifu in Kung Fu, an executive member of Kung Fu Wushu Australia, and have uh, been teaching and training for four decades in martial arts. So bullying is a major issue and has major catastrophic effects to the kids within our society, and AMADA provides a very unique opportunity. You see, currently kids have, uh, all they have access to is websites and awareness days, and uh, these websites and awareness days, based on current statistics and the growth of statistics, fall well short of the problem. And the problem being is that the kids need mentoring in schools. Now, schools are growing at a, at, um, at a massive rate. Schools are at capacity. Teachers are flat out just giving kids an education on a daily basis, let alone dealing with the social and emotional issues attracted around bullying um, that they've got to deal with. There's 160,000 kids, roughly, that avoid going to school on a daily basis in our society because of bullying issues. It's a $2.3 billion problem nationally, and uh, you're looking at a one in four ratio of kids that be bullied, um, and I'm sure you've all heard the statistics. So based on less than just under four million kids that go to school in this country, um, you're looking at a million kids every day that are dealing with this massive issue. So the unique thing with AMADA, what we provide, is we provide highly trained youth developed mentors that work with schools uh, to uh, give these kids the skills that they need to be able to deal with the problem. And this is not just the physical side of martial arts training, this is actually the mental and emotional sides uh, of uh, the training that is the most important part, teaching them uh, avoidance skills, awareness skills, the application and assessment skills to determine whether a situation is mild, dangerous or life-threatening, and to be able to mitigate uh, the negative fallout on them so that they can then get on with their lives and get an education. There is no program like this available to kids in schools. We started a little over I, oh, sorry, we start, in our first year, we started out with four schools in our pilot program, and we had amazing endorsements from all principals from all schools, as well as dozens of parents involved. We then uh, worked together with Glenn Rushton, who is uh, you know, an amazing individual uh, when it comes to uh, putting together programs for students. And we, uh, we put together the, um, the AMADA Advanced Program, which basically goes into schools. We provide a 10-week uh, intervention course, which uh, is designed to give the kids the immediate education that they need and then we have a 40-week empowerment program which is designed specifically for kids that are rolling into grade seven you see kids are going into high school earlier they're going there they're younger now than what they've ever been going into high school so what we do is we teach them the skills to be able to avoid these situations, to be able to communicate the problem, build their confidence. But we don't just work with the, the ones being bullied, we also work with the bullies. So we work with the bullies to teach them respect and integrity, and we work with the ones being bullied to teach them resilience and courage to be able to communicate the problem. We now, this, as of this or as of the last couple of months, we're now in more than 25 schools working with hundreds of school kids. The issue we've got is that our, our program is parent funded. And with anything that is parent funded, it only makes it available to the kids that can afford it. And the kids that can afford it are seldom are the ones that really truly need it. The ones that need it are the ones that are sitting there that can't afford the program that really, really need these skills. So what I'm asking council for is support of this program 
program. We've worked very closely with Councillor Angela Owen over the last couple of months, and we have rolled out the program into every single school in her, her ward with great effect and great feedback from the principals and the faculty. I am asking the councillors of Brisbane to rally behind Amada and help us ro roll out our programs into every single school in your war ward, help us with funding. Where only wanting to focus initially on 20 kids in need in every school. Now, there's over 500 schools in Brisbane, but if we, we, we made this program available to at least 20 of the kids that are most in need that are selected by the schools, we will then have a great effect, and we're talking at, uh, changing the lives of over 10,000 of our, our Brisbane kids, all right? which then rolls out to our families, our societies and our communities, and we're rolling out uh, better, better members of our community. So, I, uh, as I said, I've uh, been doing this for a very, very long time, teaching and mentoring. This is the largest initiative ever taken by any organisation to combat bullying head on and actually put a face-to-face -face approach. So, I'm, I applaud you for your help and for your assistance, Jeff Horn and myself Mr. and Glenn Rushton. Mr. McLean, your five minutes has expired. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Thank you. Please take a seat. And can I invite Councillor Maddock to respond? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. McLean, good afternoon. And thank you for uh, coming to address us this afternoon on this very important issue. Yep. Uh, my name is Peter Maddock. I'm the Councillor for the Ward of Paddington and the Chairman of our Lifestyle and Community Services uh, Committee and Program. Uh, and what our, we have a, a youth strategy within Council uh, to look at this issue of bullying and address it as we can from our perspective. Our program is based more around social engagement and interaction. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of programs that we have within our organisation that we engage with either as council or in partnership uh, with other organisations, but also with our schools. And our focus is primarily upon the junior schools rather than the state, the, the high schools. Um, our programs extend to uh, physical activities, uh, uh, not to the same extent that yours does around active and healthy program. Um, our youth hub that we have over at Green Square and Visible Inc is about community engagement and working together with each other in a creative space yep. to try and build that connection. Um, we also have recreational spaces across our wards and our BMX tracks, our skate parks are also used as opportunities for us to engage with our youth through our different services and actions and in partnership with other community facilities. Um, and we've also got the Lord Mayor's Youth Advisory Council, which is, uh, approaches uh, youth issues on a number of levels around environment, but also around the creative sector as well, and again around social inclusion. I've had the opportunity to look through the program that you've provided, and it is quite thorough. And I can see that, that your program is built around uh, personal resilience, uh, emotional resilience, uh, and then awareness of the situation around them, having the confidence to engage rather than to, uh, to try and run away or, or hide, uh, but also then um, different tools around um, safety and, yep. and self-preservation. So your program is quite broad in what it's covering, and it's interesting the way that you've set it out around the assessment tools, the homework that you've given uh, to children, and also the participation. It's great to see that Councillor Owen is working with you yep. uh, and, and that she's rolling this program out uh, in her ward. Um, I'd certainly like the opportunity to meet with you to see what other opportunities might exist. Council does have partnerships with other organisations. It yep. has some, uh, some connections with state government around some of the programs we run around active school travel and our Green Heart City Smart, which is our environment sustainability program. There may be opportunities for us as an introduction for you into yep. some of those schools. Uh, but if there is something that I can share with councillors collectively uh, through their ward offices to meet and, and engage with you on a one-to-one -one basis, I'm happy to do that as well. Bullying is obviously a, a very important issue within uh, our city. We see it not as a council, but as councillors and as parents. Yep. And it's something that cannot be tolerated. And yep. if we can work together with you to assist even a number of children, a handful of children, to be better human beings and to not have to address this issue, not only, and, and the point that you raise is an important one, it's not only the victim, but, but the bully themselves can ultimately be a victim as well in this Correct. emotional journey. Yeah. I think that's something that uh, we'd really like an opportunity to talk with you about and work with you with. So I thank you for your time uh, you. and I'll meet with you just outside and we can take the conversation further. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming in. Thank, you. Look after. thank you, everyone. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Chair of any Standing Committee? Councillor Huang. Uh, th thank you, Mr Chairman. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, over the weekend, 
Brisbane Marketing, together with Tourism Events Queensland, brought eight NRL games to Brisbane for the NRL Magic Round. Lord Mayor, can you outline how events like these are building our economy and creating jobs through tourism events and investments? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Huang, for the question, because uh, this administration is all about making sure we create more to see and do in Brisbane mm -hmm. and ensuring that we have a great series of events uh, right across the year uh, throughout the calendar that not only provides things for Brisbane residents to do, but brings people into our city, brings new visitors, brings tourists to our city. And that's exactly what happened uh, when we saw the NRL Magic Round come to Brisbane. So over four days from the 9th to the 12th of May uh, at Suncorp Stadium, we had uh, 16 uh, teams with almost 300 players uh, coming to what is a first of its kind uh, event. It's the first time that we've seen all of these teams in one city across four days um, in what really was a, a magic event for the city. We uh, support these events and we encourage these events here because it's all about making sure that we bring people to the city, we create jobs, we support our local economy and uh, we support our great lifestyle city that we have. And so uh, we know that major events bring around $150 million of benefit to our economy each year. That is real money. That is money that would not otherwise come to Brisbane if it wasn't for these uh, major events. And I can uh, proudly announce today that uh, over that four-day event, we saw more than 134,000 tickets sold uh, to those games, 134,000 tickets. That is an incredible result. And uh, I understand that around one-third of those tickets were sold to visitors from outside of the region. So that's around 40, 44,000 visitors coming to Brisbane from other parts of Queensland, from interstate, to come to our city to enjoy the magic ground, but more importantly, to enjoy what Brisbane has to offer as a lifestyle city. And uh, we see on the NRL web website that was promoting the, the part where you sign up to buy your tickets right under there um, was uh, a link directly to the Visit Brisbane website. Things to do when you're in Brisbane, restaurants to visit, uh, places to go, local businesses to support. And we know that's exactly what happened. 44,000 people approximately coming from outside of Brisbane into our region, part of the 134,000 tickets that were sold uh, for these, these games. And the feedback we have received has been absolutely fantastic. It is obviously something that is new to Brisbane. It is the first of its kind. And we want to thank the NRL, uh, the clubs, and also uh, their partners and the many sponsors involved in this uh, for bringing this to Brisbane. It was a truly fantastic outcome. I know that a number of councillors uh, enjoyed uh, watching those games as well, as did many, many members of the public. But uh, this is all about, as I said, making sure that there are activations right across the calendar year in our city. No matter what time of year, there are things to do, there are events happening, there are attractors to our city. And I know uh, from experience, as do you, that when people visit Brisbane for the first time, uh, they keep coming back. Uh, when people visit Brisbane from other parts of Queensland or other parts of Australia, the first thing they do is they say, wow, Brisbane's changed. Uh, last time I went here was you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and isn't it different? Isn't it fantastic? And it helps also to address some of those outdated perspectives and perceptions of Brisbane that some people have. Uh, and particularly, might I say, uh, people from places like Sydney and Melbourne um, who you know, rate their cities fairly well until they come to Brisbane and see what happens here. Uh, because I can say uh, that Brisbane can take Sydney and Melbourne any day when it comes to our lifestyle, uh, our fantastic restaurants and food offering, our small businesses, our great parkland and green space that we have, uh, and the ever-changing, ever-growing uh, city that we have. Things like the Riverwalk that people enjoy, uh, all of the fantastic assets that our city has. So we're all about promoting Brisbane, making sure that people come here, spend their money here, help create 
jobs and support local business, and that's exactly what happened uh, with the NRL Magic Round. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, further questions? Councillor Johnston. Yes, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, has Council decided on a preferred design for the Mogul Road Coonan Street upgrade project? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and also thank you, Councillor Johnston, for uh, the question. I can tell you that uh, upgrading our infrastructure is going to remain a key priority for this administration. And uh, whether it is building five new green bridges, uh, whether it is investing in upgrading bikeways and other infrastructure, whether it is involving uh, upgrading our road network, uh, we are absolutely focused on uh, the, not only the short term, but the medium term and the long term future of our city when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, that is why we're planning uh, and the planning work continues major upgrades right across the city, including uh, the upgrade of the Mogul Road Coonan Street uh, intersection at the roundabout there, the Indrapilly roundabout. Now, uh, I was delighted to hear that uh, we have a uh, $25 million commitment um, from uh, Julian Simmons and the Morrison government towards this project. Uh, and that is really exciting because we have uh, progressively over the years been investing in um, making sure this upgrade can occur. We acquired the roundabout site a number of years ago so that this upgrade could occur. Uh, we acquired Witten Barracks as well, not only to provide a new parkland and green space area, but to accommodate future infrastructure upgrades through the corridor along the Walter Taylor Bridge corridor. And so we have been progressively planning uh, in investing and Point doing of order, work. Mr. Chairman. Um, Point of order against you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Johnston. It's a very specific question, Mr. Chairman. Has Council decided on a preferred design for the Mogul, Street, uh, Mogul Road Coonan Street upgrade? And I'd appreciate an answer to the question. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we have invested in uh, doing work on this corridor and this particular upgrade over a period of many years, and that work continues. And I can tell you uh, that we won't be finalising a design until such time as community consultation occurs, and that is our standard practice. Now, obviously, we have uh, progressed work on options for that design, and once that work is completed, we will be going out to the community. Uh, but we will not make a decision on this until appropriate communication and engagement with the community occurs. So I can assure uh, Councillor Johnson that that will occur, as it does for all of our projects. Uh, we release plans to the community, we get their feedback, and we make changes to those plans uh, based on that feedback, uh, as uh, is appropriate to do. So this will be the same process we use for upgrades right across the city. And so this particular project, uh, uh, we have, as I said, invested a lot of work in planning. Uh, we are committed to delivering this, but obviously an investment from the federal government makes this project happen sooner than it otherwise would, uh, because uh, there are so many upgrades to be done across the city. Uh, we know this one is an important one, particularly for those in the western suburbs. But we also know that the cost of these kind of upgrades uh, can be very large. And so contributions to other, from other levels of government to these projects help them happen sooner than they otherwise would occur. And that's why I want to commend uh, Julian Simmons in getting this commitment from uh, the Morrison government towards this upgrade. Because if it wasn't for Julian Simmons and his local advocacy and the work he has done in making sure that the government knows this is a priority, uh, then this project wouldn't happen as quickly. So I can assure Councillor Johnston uh, that it will happen quicker if uh, Julian Simmons is elected and his government is elected. And certainly I know that if Labor or the Greens are elected, then you can write it off for a very, very long time. Because ultimately uh, we know that they're not as committed to the western suburbs as they should in upgrades like this. We also know that the Greens um, don't like any kind of road upgrade. And while people in uh, sitting on the Western Freeway car park or the Mogul Road car park are worried about congestion and they might be thinking about voting Green, they need to remember not going to get their roads upgraded if they vote Green. Um, 
that is a reality, and Councillor Shree would agree with that. Um, certainly, certainly won't, won't occur if anyone in the western suburbs uh, thinks they can vote green and then get roads upgraded. That, that will not be an outcome. And it won't be an outcome if they vote Labor either, because uh, while Labor has been throwing money, making all kinds of promises— Lord Mayor, your time's expired. Yep. Are there any further questions? <clears throat> Councillor Allen. My question is to Councillor Adams, Chair of the Finance and Economic Development Committee. Councillor Adams, Council has been undertaking a 12-month trial of the Safe City Network in conjunction with the National Retail Association. Can you outline the success of this trial and how Council intends to continue working with the association? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Allen, for the question, because we are absolutely focused on ensuring Brisbane is a better place to live, work and relax. And we just heard about the fantastic magic round that happened on the weekend, over 134,000 people either visiting or coming out to enjoy the magic of 16 teams all playing here. But a very big part of that is also to make sure that we have a safe and vibrant environment for our local businesses, our local small to medium enterprises and, of course, our shoppers as well, to make sure that they can enjoy their time in the CBD precincts and our suburbs while they're out shopping. That's why we are pleased to support the trial uh, by the National Retail Association. Well, we were pleased to support the trial, known as Safe City Network. Um, city Brisbane businesses are integral to, integral to the success of our economy. We know that the majority of uh, businesses in Brisbane are small to medium enterprises, and when they grow our economy grows as well. However, there is a very big threat to our retailers, especially in the CBD in Fortitude Valley, and that is retail crime. The National Retail Association estimates that the cost of retail crime in Brisbane City on businesses is around $618 million a year. That includes the cost spent on preventing retail crime, $198 million on stolen products or cash, $93 million from associated costs such as employee downtime or compensation, $93 million in repairs and $18 million in lost output and productivity. So to resolve this issue for the businesses, the National Retail Association established the Safe City Network, which is a digital platform for retailers to upload videos or photographs and details of their or other retail crimes committed in their stores. Now, this operated as a trial from March 2018 for 12 months, and the information was shared across the network to similar retailers to guard them against similar crimes in their local areas. It was an initiative that was involved um, the federal government, law enforcement agencies and retailers to help identify and prosecute offenders with real-time data. It was funded by the federal government's Safer Communities grant of $467,000, and we thank Trevor Evans MP um, for his work in making sure that we um, receive this money for our local businesses in the Fortitude Valley. Council provided in-kind support by providing the staff to manage the grant and also contract with the National Retail Association in the marketing of the program. So throughout the trial, more than 450 retailers, centre managers and loss prevention specialists were engaged. There was an increase in education and information to more than 300 stores in the trial area, which enabled them to better protect their staff and their profits. The businesses provided feedback indicating that they valued the increased reporting. They really valued sharing of the crime information, with a 21.4 per cent increase in retail crime reported to the QPS, which always helps with the data and if there's any similar incidences across the area. So the National Retail Association were able to create and distribute a number of guidelines to assist retailers to improve their processes in regard to retail crime, as well as conduct face-to-face -face engagement with 25 tours undertaking. Each tour visited 150 retailers, which saw the establishment of the Retail Crime Committee, which we're very happy to say will continue to operate. Considering the success of the NRA's um, contract, Council will be doing a $30,000 sponsorship over the next two years to ensure that this program continues to operate by providing the staffing costs to continue that one-on-one -on -one engagement, collate data, use information from retailers to continue the sharing of data through the digital uh, platform. 
We're always trying to make our city safer. A number of initiatives that we've put in place to help deter and prevent crime. In 1994, Council launched the City Safe Network, which is our CCTV cameras that are monitored 24-7 in key public spaces in Brisbane CBD. Over the last 25 years, we've been adding to that network, and it now covers key public areas in the CBD, Queen Street Mall, Valley Mall, and City Botanic Gardens. We partner with the QPS, Fortitude Valley Safety Group, major CBD shopping centres, Chaplain Watch, taxis, busway operators, all part of this network to keep our retail areas safe from harm. As well as having more than 1,000 cameras across the city to monitor road and community safety, car parks, libraries, ferry terminals and buses, we manage the 90,000 streetlights to make sure we're always Deputy Mayor, your time's expired. keeping the safety of our shoppers as they're out and about. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Mr Chair, my question is to Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, two weeks ago you said the people of Brisbane deserve stable, responsible leadership, and with this team and with myself, they will keep getting it. In the past month, this administration has been forced to replace a mayor and deputy mayor, plus councillors in Walter Taylor, McDowell, Cooperoo, Chandler and Doboy. Others have tried to bail out this term, including the councillor for Nogra and his counterpart in Callum Vale, who is using her ratepayer-funded wage to campaign for a federal seat and can't even be bothered attending council and committee meetings. This week, not only has your hand-picked successor as transport chair been unceremoniously dumped after one meeting, but membership of council's committees are being radically changed for the second week in a row under your leadership. How can this amateur hour Game of Thrones in any way be described as stable leadership? Lord Mayor. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Cumming, for the question. Um, I have to say, I make no apology that I have got an extremely talented team behind me. I make no apology that we are going through a process of renewal that brings in new ideas. Uh, Councillors, you asked a question, please listen to the answer. That brings in new talent, new ideas, and and it is in stark contrast to what we see opposite, where the Leader of the Opposition has cobwebs on him from 25 years of sitting in this place. Councillor Griffiths has been here 16 years. Talk about tired and out of touch. And I make no apology that we, for the very first time, have a cabinet that has balance, unlike those opposite, who, out of the five of them, have one female representative. One female representative. Councillors will be heard in silence. Uh, a question was asked, the answer will be heard. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And so what this administration will continue to deliver is a focus on the things that matter to the people of Brisbane, a focus on building the infrastructure our city needs, on protecting our great lifestyle and green space and creating more of it, and on focusing on what's important to the residents of Brisbane. Now, uh, Councillor Cumming, uh, I can tell you that when it comes to the changes in my team, uh, we have so many people that could step up just like that into a cabinet role. And we've seen that. We've, we've seen that happen. People who are talented, who can do the job and who can get straight into that Point role. of order. Councillors will be heard in silence. Councillor Shree. No, thanks. I was just having trouble hearing the speaker. Thank you, Councillor Shree. As I've said a few times, a question was asked. I'm sure people would like to hear the answer. Lord Mayor, please proceed. Uh, Mr Chair, it's quite clear they don't want to hear the answer. It is quite clear they don't. They just want to ask the questions uh, and they don't want to hear the answer. But the reality is, you know, it, it got me thinking, you, you know, th there are talented people in our team who can go straight into Cabinet. They have the experience to go straight in. And we've seen examples of that just in recent weeks where there's been a number of promotions and rightly deserved promotions. And we've also seen in today's meeting, uh, Councillor Allen will be stepping up to be the new finance and administration chair. And he has served as the deputy. Uh, he has an incredible breadth of experience uh, in not only in council as the deputy chair in that role, but also outside of council in business, uh, not only consulting and working here in Australia, but internationally as well. And so this is the type of talent that we have. 
And so we are never wanting for talent when it comes to our team and for our cabinet. But have a think about what would happen if those opposite actually got elected at the next election. They don't even have enough people in their team to form a cabinet. What that means is if they were elected, not only would they have an inexperienced Lord Mayor, they would have a completely inexperienced cabinet, including people that would come straight from an election and go straight into cabinet. Straight into cabinet. So uh, these, are, these are the interesting questions that are raised when... OK, councillors, speeches will be heard in silence. Yeah. These are the interesting questions uh, that need to be raised about what would happen under Labor, because you would get absolute chaos. Absolute chaos. Here, you've had the smoothest transition we have ever seen in the city's history, with a continuity of a uh, Lord Mayor who has served faithfully for eight years as Deputy Mayor, a cabinet that has experience, a team that has renewal, and we're focused on getting on with the job. Yet you have people opposite um, who, even when Labor was in administration, weren't um, seen by their colleagues as being suitable to be put into cabinet. And so Councillor Cumming was always on the backbench, even when Labor was in administration. It, and, and he's going to be one of the new cabinet members if Labor gets in. So you want to think about chaos. You want to think about uh, problems uh, with transition. Think about what would happen if we saw Labor elected at the next election. Uh, that is a very risky situation that the city of Brisbane simply cannot afford. So we will continue to renew our team, to make sure that we have talented people doing the jobs, focused on the things that are important to Brisbane. And I've got to say, you asked what happened to Ryan. Councillor Murphy tendered his resignation from Cabinet. And you know what? That was the right thing to do, because his focus is making sure that he can invest every single minute into representing the people of Chandler Lord Mayor, your, as their new councillor. Your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Toomey. Excuse me. Councillor Toomey. Sorry, Chair. One of us is on this side of the chamber. Uh, my question is to the Chair of City Planning, Councillor Burke. Councillor Burke, this administration listened to the people of Brisbane during Plan Your Brisbane and have stated its intention to ban townhouses in low-density areas across Brisbane. Can you give the Chamber an update on the progress of this and what impediments are standing in the way of Council delivering what Brisbane residents have asked for? Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I thank Councillor Toomey for that timely and uh, interesting question that he put forward. Uh, obviously, uh, many in this chamber would know the history around our plan to amend the city plan to remove the ability for people to build townhouses in low-density residential. It was a clear piece of feedback from the residents of Brisbane as part of our Plan Your Brisbane engagement exercise, where the people of Brisbane had their say about changes they would like to see in our city. Uh, and as the Lord Mayor said, one of the key things that this administration is getting on with the job of doing is protecting our lifestyle. Uh, and the residents of Brisbane said to us that they did not want to see the ongoing chopping up of our suburbs with these large townhouse developments happening in low-density residential areas. And that is why, uh, back in September last year, so eight months ago, uh, this council, uh, with uh, what was bipartisan support at the time, moved a major amendment to our city plan, major, major amendment H, uh, to the city plan. And we wrote to the minister on the 5th of September and advised him of that amendment uh, and that the process was starting. And we sought the state government's early interest check in that particular amendment. They wrote back the next day asking for further information, as many in this chamber would recall, which we provided to them five days later. And then there was silence, Mr Chair. Radio silence till the 26th of November. And of course, we all know the only reason on the 26th of November that there was correspondence from the state was that the agenda for council had already gone out showing that we were going to bring through the amendment anyway, irrespective of the state's state early state interest check, whether or not they'd provided that. But they did, at least to their credit, provide that response 31 days after the due date, Mr Chair, 31 days after the due, 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 due date, uh, they provided that correspondence back to us. We then wrote back to the minister and said, OK, we've moved the amendment. 
Here it is for your interest. And that's when it was paused, Mr Chair. That's when it became paused. Uh, and it wasn't until February when the State Minister for Development and Planning wrote to us and advised us that temporary local planning instruments were a great way to protect sites uh, that were under threat from uh, townhouse developments that are low-density residential, that are townhouse developments in this city, uh, like the one at Eric Road, an example he used, that council moved a temporary local planning instrument. Taking the advice of the minister, we moved a temporary local planning instrument to protect the residents of Brisbane from this type of development, which they had clearly said to us that they did not want going on. Uh, and so what happened to that temporary local planning instrument, Mr Chair? Well, the state paused that too. So, so defiant of the will of the residents of Brisbane, the state have decided to play games with this amendment every step of the way. We responded to their information request with the same information that we'd already provided to them twice, but we responded. They paused it again, Mr Chair, uh, and we responded again with the further information uh, that they required. Uh, and we provided that information back to them uh, on the 11th of April in compliance with their pause notice. And since then, have we heard anything, Mr Chair? Have we heard anything out of the state government after that information has been provided back to them? Well, no. And in the ministerial guidelines and rules under the Planning Act 2016, Chapter 3, Part 2, Section 8, the minister must, within 20 business days, give a notice stating approval or no approval. Well, those 20 business days finished last week. So the state is now four days overdue on providing their approval or non-approval on the temporary local planning instrument that we put forward to, to protect residents uh, in this city from having townhouses built in low density residential. It's a shame, Mr Chair, that the Labor Party has continued to play games through this whole process, whether it's through the major amendment, which is sitting paused and the state refuses to act on, or now with this temporary local planning instrument, which would have given residents certainty and provided the opportunity for council to at least protect those sites while we go through the formal amendment process, which council had started back in September last year. Eight months. Eight months of inaction by the state government, eight months of an inability to make a decision on this particular issue, when this administration and this council has been sending a very loud and clear message about what we want to see, what the residents of Brisbane told us through Plan Your Brisbane that they wanted to see, Mr Chair. This isn't something that the Lord Mayor and Cabinet had decided. This was feedback from the residents of Brisbane, and it's playing out in suburbs across the city. All you have to do is go to, uh, down into Councillor Strunk's ward and listen to the feedback at the Civic Cabinet. Councillor listens Burke, down uh, there where residents Burke, clearly said. Your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, the, uh, my question is to the Chair of the Environment, Planning and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Hammond. Including the numerous hours of work done by uh, council bureaucrats on the failed zip line plan and the cost of promotional materials, such as the $78,000 flyer sent out days before it was canned, can you inform residents the true total cost of this failed election campaign whim? Mr. Chair. Councillor. I'm actually happy like to answer that question. I've got the information at hand, if uh, Councillor Hammond doesn't mind. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Cumming. And, and once again, uh, we in this administration make no apologies for listening to the community and for making the decisions that need to be made. Um, because it's been fascinating to, uh, to see the response it's almost as though those opposite were disappointed that we made the decision that we did yeah, that's right. because they had nothing to, to throw mud at. Over again to Lord Mayor, Councillor Cassidy. If the Lord Mayor could answer the question, uh, how mm. much did this whole failed campaign for the zipline cost people of Brisbane? Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr Chair, and as you know, I have five minutes to answer the, to the, answer the question and I intend to uh, answer the question in five minutes. Uh, so, uh, look, the, the issue of the zip line, um, well, it was an interesting one for the city because, um, as I said in my uh, first question, we want to create more to see and do in this city. There's no doubt about that. And creating uh, tourism opportunities for people, creating adventure tourism opportunities, creating eco-tourism opportunities are very important things. 
And uh, certainly, as I've said before, there is a place in Brisbane for a zip line. And I have no doubt that someone will come up with an idea uh, for a suitable location for a zip line that will get a lot of support. Uh, and there's been um, uh, one proposed for Queen's Wharf development uh, in the city. And I have no doubt there'll be other opportunities that come up from time to time. But Mount Cutha, I believe, and my team believes, was ultimately the wrong location for this type of infrastructure. So we took the decision, we listened to the community feedback, we made the decision that had to be made. Now, what I can say is this. Uh, I can say that uh, council initially said we would take on the following costs, that we would make a contribution uh, to Zipline Australia of a million dollars. Uh, we also said that we would pay for the costs of the DA. Now, the DA, separate cost to the cost of um, uh, the one million dollars to Zipline Australia, it was our DA, so of course we're going to pay for that. That was uh, the part of the agreement going forward. Uh, and so uh, I previously confirmed that we had paid $300,000 uh, to Zipline Australia. I can also confirm that when it came to the DA, there were a whole lot of technical reports, including external consultants that needed to be done. There was a whole lot of time and energy that went into that DA. And I remember distinctly standing up in this, or hearing in this chamber Labor saying, we need to spend more money on the technical reports, and we even needed to do an EIS. I remember they made that claim. So they were saying money on technical reports was money well spent. Uh, so I can confirm that $902,879.79 are the costs that I'm aware of in relation to the DA. Uh, so uh, that is what I'm aware of at the moment. That was the cost of preparing, lodging the DA, getting the technical reports, um, and making sure we uh, progress that in a manner that provided information to the community and to the assessors so that they could make a decision on this. And, uh, you know, I'm sure Labor will say, oh, all that money, that money was making sure a thorough process occurred with the DA, including those technical reports. And whether it was environmental reports, arborist reports, traffic reports, engineering reports, they all had to be prepared. And this is the kind of uh, process that we would expect any developer, any developer to take when they're making a proposal for what is a major project. Now, I understand that the, uh, the project value uh, of the zipline, so the investment that would have been made um, in the project by Zipline Australia uh, was something um, to the tune of $18 million. So we're talking about a project you know, of, of around $18 million. Uh, so, if you look at what we build here in terms of infrastructure, if we're building a bikeway or a road upgrade and it costs $18 million, it is not unreasonable to expect to spend a million dollars on the planning, the design, the technical reports. That is something that, you know, is just business as usual for council. You've got to invest the money in the planning and the design. And so that was our responsibility for this project. We did invest that money. Uh, as per the agreement, uh, and that is the answer to your question, Councillor, coming uh, up front uh, that I'm aware of at this stage. So that's the information I've been provided, uh, being completely up front with you, uh, and in ensuring that we did those uh, reports that needed to be done, provided the information for the assessment, the planning and design of that project. Further questions? Councillor Wyndham. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, my question is to the Chair of the Lifestyle and Community Services Committee, Councillor Matic. Councillor Matic, one of our election commitments in 2016 was to improve the sporting facilities for our local sporting groups. Can you please update the Chamber on the success to date and any further or future improvements expected as part of this initiative? Councillor Matic. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor Wyndham for the question and the opportunity to update the Chamber on what is a very important issue in all our wards and our commitment to our various uh, sporting groups and facilities uh, across the Brisbane community. Um, I'm pleased to say that the Community Facilities Planning and Design Program is undertaken, uh, undertaken regularly uh, to investigate the condition uh, audits of all fields in the Brisbane catchment. Uh, to identify and report field conditions and issues and associated safety risks. Um, council sport, field and hard court 
condition rehabilitation project aims to facilitate ideal sport conditions for the community. And the project supports council's um, community sports club tenants and uh, to meet their obligations to manage and cost effectively maintain their sport fields in accordance with their lease, maintenance and development plan and to the satisfaction of their members. So this project enables the clubs to cost effectively maintain a safer playing surface, working hand in glove with Brisbane City Council on these technical and sometimes difficult issues to address the, the use, the wear, the tear, to uh, find opportunities for uh, harvesting that water, but importantly also to deal with runoff and other associated issues that can directly impact on the quality of that playing field. As councillors would know, a lot of our clubs are not for profit. Um, they're uh, made up of volunteers. And so any and all assistance that council can provide in what is normally a very uh, costly exercise is of enormous benefit, not only to the club, but to the wider community. And I can say that within this financial year, there are a number of uh, clubs and parks that we are undertaking or have undertaken work and are undertaking further work in Warburton Park, uh, Ditmar Park, Horizon Drive Park and Kookaburra Park. Now within Warburton Park, uh, there is significant field remediation uh, work that was undertaken. And North St Joseph's Junior Rugby League Club uh, hold a lease over the site and that's located at Virginia. The club was established in 1966 and has a long and proud history and it has uh, several hundred members. Um, the issue with this park, as assessed by the officers, was that the subsurface irrigation system at the site uh, has been compromised by upgrade works. And so it's it was important that um, this we mitigated the impact on performance, uh, but of course also the pressure issues uh, on the water supply within the operating system. So as a result of the irrigation issues, uh, Norths has been unable to undertake necessary turf maintenance which has ex uh, impacted on the, the amount of use that the field can have, but also, of course, on those acceptable safety standards. So the team undertook a considerable amount of work and investigation to ensure that the field remediation project included the design and construct of the main field and installation of a suitable irrigation system to address issues that have impacted the use of the facility. The end result of that being that the club has a brand new asset and a system in place to deal with irrigation and maintenance and the quality of the playing field. And I can say that the works have proceeded uh, uh, appropriately and that the handover is scheduled for late May of this year. These are the kind of examples of what, the, of what uh, this division, but importantly this administration, is committed to, to our various clubs and groups across our city. Now within Ditmar Park, there were drainage works that needed to be undertaken. So the Southside Community Group is the head lessee of the site and it's located at Upper Mount Cravat. And the Mount Cravat Australian Football Club is a subtenant. So you're getting significant use. And of course, this club was established in 1964. So you can see the long history and established history that this, that this club has and the significant amount of benefit it provides to the broader community. Now, um, within the uh, in previous financial years, Council has uh, undertook major field remediation works and large volumes of water and ponding issues in the northwest section of the field following rainfall were noticed to have a significant impact on the quality of the turf and impacted on playability. So the project that we saw within this uh, financial year involved rectification of the existing drainage system in the northwest corner of the field. And the project has proven to be successful when the club experienced significant rainfall uh, in, on Friday the 15th of March that would have previously resulted in the ground being closed on games uh, for games and therefore postponed. The field drained completely during the night and the ground was deemed fit Councilor for play Maddock, on the Saturday. Your time Thank you, Mr Chair. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Mr Chair, my question is also to Councillor Maddock. Councillor Maddock, with, this, with the financial year rapidly drawing to close, can you detail whether the $831,000 allocated in this year's budget for restoration of the historic School of Arts building has been spent, or whether Brisbane people will continue to be locked out of this irreplaceable link to our history while this council dithers over its future? Councillor Maddock. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank uh, Councillor Cummings for the question and the opportunity to provide a, a proper understanding to all councillors in this chamber of the significant amount of work that, uh, and money allocated, as Councillor Cumming has just said, to the chamber that this administration has put towards this project. And that $800,000 is a clear example of the contribution that we are undertaking. Now, as councillors would know, the School of Arts has a very proud and long history within this city. At the turn of the century, uh, its initial use was for the care of young women who uh, did not have a home or, or parents. And so it was Lady Bowen at the time that undertook the process of forming a trust and undertaking that work. Over time, the use of the facility did change to more of a community purpose. And eventually the land was granted in trust to Brisbane City Council for the use of a library. And so you can see over a significant period of time, if not 100 years, the significant amount of work that, uh, that the facility utilised, but also its multiple uses. Now, when the library was established within uh, Brisbane City Council itself, within City Hall, the library was transferred and the, the building undertook other uses, again, of a community purpose. Over that time, there have been different transformations of the building's exterior structure to utilise those different uses. And it wasn't until the uh, 1980s that we saw the uh, previous cladding removed and the building back to its former state. Point of no. order. Point of order again to Councillor Maddock. Uh, Councillor Cumming. I didn't ask uh, Councillor Maddock for the history of the building. I asked him, how's the $831,000 being spent? Has it been spent? What's been done this financial year? Councillor Maddock, to the question, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I'm, I'm answering the question. In order for Councillor Cummings to understand the breadth of the work that is required, he needs to understand the history. Because it's easy to say, what are you going to do about it? But in their time, in those dark, dingy days of labour, within this council, Mr Chair, these people on the other side did not invest in that building. And so the state of that building continued to, uh, to degrade, Mr Chair, so that we got to a stage within the 90s and in the early 2000s, where we were leasing the building out to other organisations. I remember in 2008 attending events there as the environment chairman for various social groups in a building that was once great and graceful, but under the leadership of, this, of the ALP during those dark days, Mr Chair, were seen to degrade. And so it was this administration that then undertook the necessary task of of removing those tenants at the end of their lease period and then undertaking the significant amount of work required to investigate returning this building to its heritage status. Their history, Mr Chair, is a dark one. This building is an example of their failure over generations to fix it up, and that building again reflects their poor management. Again, this administration fixed this building up and this administration order. will also be fixing up the School order of Arts. Against you, Councillor Maddock, uh, Councillor Mr. Cassidy. Chair, the, Councillor Maddock is clearly just debating the question. It was very clear how much of this $831,000 will be spent this financial year. He needs to stop debating the question and start answering it. Councillor Maddock, you've got uh, a minute to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr Chair, the story of this building is a great story for this side of the administration because we're committed to making sure that it goes back to its former glory. Those opposite think that this is a simple task, but the reality it is, is that it is not. It requires the proper assessment of a building of significant historical and heritage value to our city to make sure that we appoint the necessary people to undertake that study. We also need to look at its uses and how we can best complement that for the community as a whole. All of this work has been undertaken in this financial year, and we're getting on with the task of delivering. But to just rush in and simply put a Band-Aid on a building might be something that the ALP can do and is renowned for doing, but the reality of the situation is that it needs to be done properly. And only this administration has the ability, the skill, the time and the investment to make sure that happens. I will proudly be able to come back to this state, in this chamber as we continue uh, the evolution and the assessment of that building to update the chamber, to inform the people of Brisbane that we are looking after this important asset. And those 
opposite can continue to interrupt and do nothing as they always do. But this administration does not step back on preserving heritage buildings within our city and preserving our heritage and, and culture and making sure that we're delivering. So, Mr Chairman, there is nothing to hide than everything to tell in this story, and I will stand proudly by this administration in continuing to deliver and preserve what is an important asset for our city, rather than those opposite that simply say, what are you doing now? Because my question to them is, what were you doing during the dark, dingy days when you did nothing to this building? What have you done for heritage and culture in this city? What have you done for the heritage buildings of this city? The answer is nothing, 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 and they'll always be doing nothing, Mr Chair. This administration will get on with the important task, and we are already undertaking the heritage assessment of that building, and we will deliver expired. something that the city can be Councilor proud Mayor, of. Your time has expired, and that concludes question time. Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination Committee, please. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, Again, to Lord Mayor, uh, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to move the following urgency motion. I move that this council spend so much standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion that this LMP council urgently develops an action plan to save Brisbane's remaining community bowls clubs and present it to the chamber within four weeks. Do you have that in writing? Seconded. Sorry. Sorry. That's, that's moved by Councillor Griffiths. Seconded by is that Councillor Cassidy. Do you have that in writing for me? Sorry. Thank you. And um, all right. So, um, to urgency, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, um, we just heard the lines. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing from the, the chairperson of, peop of, of the people responsible for the bowls clubs across Brisbane. That's what's happened under this LMP administration. Nothing has happened with our bowls clubs. Nothing. We have no plan to save our bowls clubs. We have no plan to look after our bowls clubs. These people, this LMP administration, have been in power 16 years. They have had, held the mayoralty of this city for 16 years, and after 16 years, we have no plan, no idea how this city intends to save its bowls clubs. And I say that as a person who's just witnessed the closure of Maruka Bowls Club, one of our strongest bowls clubs in this city, the, the club that uh, showed us off to the world. Uh, in terms of the Commonwealth Games that had a 50-year history. It has just closed its doors. And what was Brisbane City Council's response? Nothing. Do nothing because we have a plan to do nothing. Same with today. We read that the Cannon Hills Bowls Club will be closing its doors. What's Council's plan? Do nothing. Similarly, we saw with the other clubs around the city, um, Sunnybanks Bowls Clubs, their doors were closed. Council had no plan for that. And East Brisbane's Bowls Club as well was closed. This city had no plan for that. What was the LNP's plan? What did it pull out of the hat last minute in terms of the East Brisbane Bowls Club? They wanted to sell the land and build two 12-storey towers, <laughs> residential towers. This council, this LNP council, wanted to sell the land off to build residential towers on a community facility site for this city. Shame. What about Tarragindi Bowls Club? What did Councillor Adams do with that? That's been developed off. It's been sent off to build units. <coughs> it's gone. There is no plan for our bowls clubs. What about Yoronga Bowls Club? Yes. Councillor Johnson, you fought to save this club. What's happened to it? It's in limbo. Yep. This council, is it going to buy it back? Is it going to save this land? Is it going to allow development on this land? This LMP administration has no plans for our bowls clubs. There is no written plan. No one can go to a plan and see what their plan is. This city has no plan for its bowls clubs. Madam, oh, Madam Chair, Mr Chair, this is wrong. This is wrong that we have a council here and a mayor Griffiths. here Your time's expired. who have no plans for our bowls clubs. All right, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells.
Attendants, please close the bars. Uh, clerks, please read the result. Mr. Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 15 against. Thank you. Councillors, please return to your chairs. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I seek leave to suspend uh, standing orders in order to allow me to move an urgency motion that this council ensures that public consultation is undertaken with the councillor for Tennyson and Tennyson Ward residents regarding plans for the upgrade of the Mogul Road Coonan Street roundabout to ensure residents in the southwestern suburbs are not disadvantaged by the design. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor. Moved by Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Do you have that in writing for me? Thank you. You have three minutes for urgency. Yes, thank you. Um, as I asked in my question earlier today, uh, this matter is quite urgent because there is conflicting information in public uh, about this issue. Firstly, um, just a few weeks ago, the former councillor for Walter Taylor publicly, uh, publicly announced that the Mogul Road roundabout project was, and I quote, shovel ready. Um, that was news to me uh, because I certainly hadn't heard anything about it, and I've written to the Lord Mayor asking, the former Lord Mayor asking, uh, what's going on. So I did an, a review of the files, and the files were illuminating. The files were illuminating. Let me be clear this is the status of the situation. There are eight different designs that Council is currently looking at. There is no preferred design. There is no business case. There is no funding for the project allocated in the Council budget other than for this preliminary uh, design work. Consultation is not expected to occur until later in the year um, if and when a preferred design is announced. There are, however, plans already drawn up showing images of new high-rise buildings being developed around the intersection. There are plans drawn up showing uh, a new intersection at Keating Street. There are no plans at all, at all, in any of this preliminary documentation, and there's thousands of pages, uh, showing that Coonan Street will be upgraded uh, further uh, to the south nor are there any plans uh, to show that it will have improvements linking to the Walter Taylor Bridge, another lie from Councillor Simmons in the local paper just a few weeks ago. Now, today we heard the new Lord Mayor say that there would be consultation. So let's have a look what the consultation plan says. Now, it was drawn up last year, so I would suggest to him uh, that it needs to be amended. Um, uh, the internal stakeholders for Council are a whole range of senior council officers, Councillor Cooper, Councillor Cooper's uh, senior PLO, Councillor Simmons, as he was at the time. Um, do you think maybe the adjoining councillor for whom this project is life or death for their residents in terms of moving across the river has been added to the consultation list? No. External stakeholders, maybe they think, well, she's not really part of our team, so we'll put her on the list for external stakeholders. No, the KFC is on the list for external stakeholders, but it's the councillor for tennis and ward and the residents who've got to drive across the bridge to this roundabout to get into the city. Are they on the list? No, they're not, but the KFC is. So, yeah, excellent. So, to Councillor Schrinner, as the new Lord Mayor, and I councillor encourage Johnston, you to vote for this councillor motion Johnston, to ensure— expired. Uh, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The country no. no. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassie and Councillor Johnson. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells.
Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 15 against. Thank you. The noes have it. Please return to your chairs. Lord Mayor, I think we're ready for establishment coordination. Yeah, maybe. Please. Okay, uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 7th of May 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated excuse me, Tuesday, the 7th of May 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Lord Mayor. Yes. Um, uh, firstly, uh, to the two urgency motions that uh, were raised, I just wanted to make a few comments on both of those matters. Uh, the issue of bowls clubs. Uh, look, Councillor Griffiths, if you think that any council or any government can save a sport, then you are deluded. Okay? Uh, we don't determine which sports are popular. Uh, we simply make sure that this city caters for a wide range of sports, uh, and we will continue to do so. And so the problem of bowls clubs um, facing difficulty, facing declining use, declining membership, declining financial stability, is not something that is new, unique to Brisbane, uh, it is, and is certainly not something the council has a magic wand that, wand that they can wave and fix. But we do know that there are examples across the city where bowls clubs have looked outside the box and started doing things a little bit differently, using different models, uh, and they have actually managed to turn things around. Um, and there's some, there's some great examples of that happening. And so the answer is not for council to suddenly step in and you know, somehow prop up bowls clubs. That, that, you know, that is not a sustainable way going forward, because what will happen is, um, Ultimately, that will be an increasing burden on the ratepayer every year. But in the end, um, people have the right to choose which sports they play, and clubs have the right to manage themselves as well. Um, so there is a very nuanced uh, and subtle approach that needs to be taken to this rather than some kind of sledgehammer um, you know, motion on the run, knee-jerk motion on the run. So we are aware bowls clubs are struggling. Some of those bowls clubs are on council-owned land. Some of them are on private land. Uh, and that is also a distinct difference as well. In cases where bowls clubs are on council land and they are struggling, we really do our best to try and help them. Um, and sometimes we've had success, sometimes we haven't. But if a bowls club closed down on council land, then generally what we do is we make that land available for other sporting clubs to use or other community groups. And so we will continue to make sure that if it's a council-owned facility, it is available for sport or community purposes. Uh, when it comes to private land, obviously that, that is not something that council has direct control over. Councillor Griffiths knows that. He is just playing a political angle here, unfortunately. Um, and, so, and some of the claims that he made were just blatantly untrue. Uh, uh, point of order. Point of order against you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Griffiths. Oh, will the Lord Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? No, Councillor Griffiths, he won't. Lord Mayor, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Not Chair. Um, some of the claims that were made were just blatantly untrue. Um, so, you know, the Tarragindi example, absolute untrue. The proposal included the creation of a brand new bowls club. So, um, yeah, look, I will leave it at that, but it is not as simple as Councillor Griffiths would make it to be. And Council can't step in um, and determine which sports are popular and which sports are not. Um, we don't run sporting clubs in general. Uh, we do our best to help, but we're not in full control of how these things work. When it comes to um, uh, the issue of the Coonan Street uh, upgrade, Coonan Street, um, Indrapilly Roundabout, Mogul Road upgrade, um, we didn't support that urgency motion not because we don't intend to consult the community and not because we don't intend to consult Councillor Johnston. And I can assure Councillor Johnston that there will be, that there will be community consultation and that she will be consulted as a result of this uh, as we move forward. 
uh, and I can give her that assurance. That will occur. However, I am not going to support a motion uh, which favours one section of uh, the community over another in the way that she suggested, um, because obviously uh, she is very interested in residents coming through that Walter Taylor corridor. And I'll tell you, we're interested in both corridors. We are interested in both corridors. So to suggest that we should, through a motion and the wording of that motion, favour one over the other would be inappropriate. And so that's why we didn't support that particular motion. Um, so uh, Point of order. ultimately... Point of order against you, Lord Mayor. Councillor uh, Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. Claim to be, mis claim to be misrepresented, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, ultimately, we will do community consultation. Councillor Johnston and her residents will be part of that community consultation. Uh, I can say that that will absolutely occur going forward. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to get into you know, which, which uh, community should be favoured over another. I don't think that's helpful for anyone. As a local councillor, I understand she would have that view. Fair enough. Um, but I'm not going to buy into that particular one personally. So moving on to uh, some general matters. Um, it's been a, another extremely busy and productive week. Um, it was, uh, you know, I've got to say, uh, in, in this role, every week you see amazing things happening around the city, and it is just so heartening. And that started last week uh, in particular when um, myself and the Lady Mayoress went to the refugee welcome ceremony in City Hall here and saw all of the newly arrived uh, residents in our city who are refugees and their enthusiasm for Brisbane and the way that they just appreciated being here so much and also appreciated the opportunity to uh, have access to the organisations that are there to help them and to have their City Council and their Lord Mayor tell them that they are welcome here. Um, and so that was just a fantastic event. Um, and uh, that was followed up on Friday when we had the Royal Humane Society of Australasia Bravery Awards. Um, and this is something that is organised um, periodically to, away, uh, to reward um, people who have put their lives in danger in order to attempt to save someone else. Um, and, and some incredible stories came out of that, in particular, uh, a 12-year-old boy who received the, the biggest award on the day, him and his family were uh, passing by the beach and, and they saw a distressed family looking and pointing out into the water. Um, the father of that family was literally about to drown. This 13 or 12-year-old boy, I think at the time, basically jumped out of the car grabbed his boogie board, I understand, swam out and saved a 100 kilogram fully grown man. Now, this is a 12 year old boy. Um, and so that whole family wouldn't have a father if it wasn't for that incredible act of bravery by a 12 year old boy. Um, so, and there were so many other incredible stories like that as well. Uh, another one was the um, situation that some people may remember where a car uh, went off uh, the road um, on Kingston Smith Drive and ended up in the Brisbane River. A truck driver who was passing by stopped his truck, jumped into the river, swam out and saved the man from the car. Um, and so just fantastic uh, examples like that of bravery in our community that rightly should be rewarded. Um, there are also a number of those awards given to members of the police and emergency services. Uh, but these awards were given above and beyond their their normal course of duty. So they, they went further than they would be expected to normally go as a police officer or a fire officer or emergency officer. So just incredible story. Um, uh, on Friday morning, I jumped off the, uh, the Goodwill Bridge together with Councillor Toomey um, in support of the great work that Hear and Say have been doing uh, in support of children uh, with deafness um, and it was fantastic, Councillor Toomey, that uh, here and say managed to raise $32,000 from uh, this, the various jumpers off the bridge. Um, and it was pretty fun too. Um, I was terrified for a moment, but then enjoyed it um, once the swinging started. We had um, some more great events on the weekend with the um, 
uh, light up or up in lights event at Racecourse Road, which was partially funded by council, partially by Trevor Evans and the federal government to create a tree lined boulevard of trees with um, fairy lights or bud lights in them. Just a fantastic initiative of the local business traders out there. Uh, and then on the weekend, uh, the McGregor State, F State School May Fest, um, their big fundraising fate for the year and the uh, Mother's Day Multicultural Dumpling Festival. Um, and it was as delicious as it sounds. I would like to uh, just let people know about some of the um, uh, great initiatives we're trying to draw attention to over the coming uh, days and weeks. Uh, through our Light Up program, where we light up the Story Bridge and Victoria Bridge in support of various uh, causes and charities and, and events. Um, so today, the Story Bridge uh, and Victoria Bridge will be lit blue um, to support National Families Week. Um, on Wednesday, both bridges will be lit blue and purple to raise awareness for Huntington's disease. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Extension. Move for an extension. Second. Sorry, microphone didn't go on. Extension moved by uh, the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Second. Councillor Allen. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, so, uh, blue and purple on Wednesday to raise awareness for Huntington's disease. On Thursday, Story Bridge and Victoria Bridge will be lit blue, green and yellow to support Australian Heavy Vehicle Industry Week. Uh, on Friday, the Story Bridge will be lit in the colours of the rainbow to support the Idaho Day, the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia, uh, which is commemorated around the world. And we will also again be flying the rainbow flag from Story Bridge, uh, very, uh, from the um, City Hall very proudly. On Friday uh, as well, um, Brisbane City Hall will be lit gold to celebrate the dancing CEO's gala dinner. And on Saturday, the Story Bridge and Victoria Bridge will be lit blue and white to celebrate, not the election victory, uh, but Paniyiri, Paniyiri uh, on the weekend. So um, another fantastic event for the city. In turning to uh, the items in front of us, um, item A, the major amendment package for retirement and aged care. This is all about our efforts to make sure that as our residents age, they have places to live in their local communities. And uh, we all know of the problem where, uh, as residents age in a particular area, many of them have in the past been forced to move out to far away areas, away from their family, away from their local community, uh, in order to find retirement and aged care. So we want to do something about that. We are doing something about that. And these uh, amendments are part of our strategy to help deliver new um, aged care and retirement living options for our residents. And so this is a process we started back in June 2016. Despite the best efforts of the state government to delay this process for political reasons, uh, we have persisted. Uh, unfortunately, the state government sat on these uh, draft plans from the 12th of December 2016 to the 6th of April 2018. Uh, so they unfortunately delayed us quite significantly in this process, but we persisted uh, because we need to make sure that our older residents have options in their local community in which to retire and live as they age. I can say uh, that since the former Lord Mayor Graham Quirk announced the Retirement Age Care Incentive Scheme, Council has approved more than 80 applications, which include over 2,800 new retirement uh, units and 2,700 aged care beds. So this is already making a significant difference. Council's actions are creating homes for our elderly, and we look forward to continuing to do so uh, with initiatives such as this amendment package. Next item on the agenda, item B, is the Gap Neighbourhood Plan. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of those plans which um, had an interesting res response from the community, um, Councillor Toomey. Um, where the community said, we don't really want much to change. And so we didn't change very much at all. Um, so uh, that I think will be well received um, and has been well received by uh, the GAP community. It is a very unique part of the city. And obviously it's all about protecting that fantastic lifestyle they have out there uh, and making sure it continues on in, in the wishes of the community. 
Uh, item C, animal management services procurement. Uh, the existing arrangements for animal management services conclude on the 17th of October this year. Current arrangements provide the following key services, management of the animal rehoming centres, animal collection services and 24-hour livestock impounding. Uh, since 2014, the Animal Welfare League of Queensland has managed Council's two animal rehoming centres located at Bracken Ridge and Willowong. Um, the new arrangement will uh, involve the following services, management of animal rehoming, animal collection services, 24-hour livestock impounding and care of animals and evacuation centres. So a new uh, category has been added uh, from disaster management, and that is the care of animals at evacuation centres during a disaster, which is obviously something that is um, you know, uh, unique to Brisbane, unique to Queensland, uh, where we do have to plan for natural disasters. Natural disasters do occur, uh, and this is about incorporating our um, care, the care of animals during those type of events in the arrangement, which I think is a really smart and wise thing to do. Item D, uh, smart poles. This uh, is something I'm particularly excited about. Um, as technology evolves around the world and um, uh, cities around the world strive to become smart cities, uh, smart poles are part of that. I know we will hear more about this from uh, Councillor Cooper, but uh, initiating the installation of smart poles at a number of locations is part of this arrangement. So we can see the potential that they have to offer when it comes to technology and providing better services to council and to the community. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing that rolled out. Uh, we also have at item E, stores board submission regarding the contract variation for Anzac Square stage four, landscaping and building works. Uh, there is no additional expenditure exceeding the approved budget being sought. And in fact, this project has been and will be completed under the original budget. Um, however, there are a few reasons for the variation. Um, complying with development approval conditions by the state government is a large contributor. Heritage conditions issued by the Queensland government impacted on major build elements and resulted in post-market changes to the lift design, the balustrades, the elevated walkway and the stairs. Uh, so a variation of the provisional sum allowance relates to a higher than anticipated tendered costs for the bronze commemorative screens. Those bronze commemorative screens uh, it will just be a fantastic part of this project. Uh, and I think it's really important that it is done properly as is planned as part of this. But the screens will uh, line both sides of the square and they will uh, have the names uh, etched into them of the many towns and places across uh, Queensland where our um, service men and women came from uh, fighting in the wars. And so I think um, that was a big part of it. So ultimately, as I mentioned, this project is uh, under budget overall, uh, but this is um, a change within the existing arrangements. I think that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Johnson, um, your uh to be misrepresented, but please um, can you keep your comments to the misrepresentation and not relitigate your point? Sure. Uh, the uh, Lord Mayor said that I was seeking favouritism um, when it came to the Moggle Road roundabout upgrade project. Uh, clearly, as my speech said, I was asking for Tennyson Ward residents and residents uh, who live in the southwestern suburbs to be included in the consultation. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, uh, in relation to the Establishment Coordination Committee report, item A, the uh, age, package B, aged care amendments. Uh, Mr Chair, we still don't support the uh, aged care package, uh, which comes back to Council again today. Uh, it appears the administration have backed down yet again on what can be built across the road from low-density residential. Their original proposal was uh, the low-density height of 9.5 metres above natural ground level plus four storeys on top of that. Uh, then it was back to two storeys and now it appears there's no increase in height at all. Uh, Mr Chair, rest assured this would not be happening unless the uh, opposition had brought pressure to bear and there also 
would not be happening if there wasn't an election 10 months away. Uh, it also wouldn't be happening if uh, political donations from developers had not been banned. But anyhow, those, that's the, uh, that's the, the uh, full uh, reason for that occurring. Uh, the uh, administration is still allowing commercial development as part of an aged care project, whether it be clubs, childcare centres, shops, etc., up to 10 per cent of the floor area of the project or 800 square metres, whichever is the lesser. And uh, our problem here is that these mini shopping centres will cause noise, traffic, other amenity problems in residential areas. And with vacancy rates uh, in uh, uh, resident in commercial properties across the city quite high. Uh, I don't really think the last thing Brisbane needs is uh, more suburban shops, but uh, anyhow. The administration sells these proposed amendments, and we heard the Lord Mayor say that again today, as though they will be extra nursing home beds in Brisbane so people can go into a nursing home in the suburb they have lived in all their life. The reality is the developments likely to occur are high-end, expensive, multi-storey retirement villages, which will be advertised for buyers right throughout South East Queensland. And I can recall uh, door knocking the uh, Aveo uh, retirement village in my ward some years ago and being uh, uh, quite surprised at the spread of places the owners had previously lived. You know, they come from Toowoomba, they come from the western suburbs of Brisbane. They weren't local people, that, uh, that large numbers of local people, they came from everywhere. So this, this, this idea that it's all going to be built locally for locals to go into is rubbish. It's absolute rubbish and that's, that's not how that industry works. So, uh, so absolutely no, nothing to do with ageing in place. And uh, the, of course the other objection we have to this policy as it involves development where no infrastructure charges will be payable. So a select form of development, primarily high-end retirement villages will be more profitable by not having to pay infrastructure charges, which of course are supposed to be used by councils to provide facilities such as parks, uh, road upgrades and the like. Uh, instead, a select group of developers will get a free ride and, as I said, increased profits. In relation to item B, the Gap Neighbourhood Plan, my colleagues will comment on this as well, but this is a nothing plan which won't deal with all the congestion problems being faced by the Gap. It shows the current councillor, Councillor Toomey, to be a proven failure whose vote collapsed in the 2016 election and will go down even further in 2020. In relation to item C, the uh, Stores Board submission on to establish a significant contracting plan for animal management services. We're, I've expressed concern recently about the number of, uh, of tenders that have been uh, come through council where there's only been one tenderer and we're concerned this could happen with these, uh, these tenders as well. Uh, reading paragraph 36, it appears there may only be one tender for the management of the animal rehoming centres, which we are concerned about. Uh, we believe uh, that the Animal Welfare League in Queensland, ALWQ, has done a reasonable job in management of animal rehoming centres, but it would be preferred to have a competitive tender situation. Likewise with animal collection services, where Brisbane Livestock Services provides the animal collection services and stock impounding. And also, Council has decided to introduce a new category for care of animals at evacuation centres. But again, the Council itself, it says in the documents, is not confident of getting more than one tenderer. So these are an important group of services for, uh, for the city and for the animals that live in the city, and we support this process and we hope that they can get some more competition. In relation to item D, the Stores Board submission on smart poles, I've actually been to a conference on, uh, on use of uh, technology in, uh, in councils in, uh, in Queensland and uh, across Australia, and uh, I've got to say that uh, Brisbane's a bit slow in this regard, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam, Mr Chairman, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, conference I went to, uh, the speaker from the city of Rockhampton, uh, which has only got 81,000 people, uh, talked about their uh, smart pole initiatives which started back in 2016 and uh, introduced they do smart poles in their riverside area uh, of Rockhampton CBD recently extended to gardens area and even to a uh, uh, to an area where they're in, in Mount Morgan uh, an old town in in the area and also uh, also the uh, a boat ramp a boat ramp and uh, they can 
provide, find very interesting uh, information on how many people use the boat ramp and, uh, and they even where they're from. They, they have uh, uh, recognition of number plates so they can see how many people from interstate are using the boat ramp. So, uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's all very interesting. And uh, I've got to say their, uh, their cost of their poles was uh, averaging $35,000 a pole for the, for the project since they started, whereas ours are going to cost uh, 100000 a pole. But anyhow, look, at the end of the day, uh, we support this initiative. It's a, uh, it's a uh, worthy idea and uh, we think that uh, the problem, I guess, is that it's going to be, again, CBD focus, but that's what you'd come to expect from this administration, CBD focus, yeah, that all, all the money goes into the CBD. Uh, this is, but uh, that's no surprise. I, I'm glad to see the Wynnum Foreshore is getting a poll, Madam. Uh, Mr Chairman, that's, that's, that's it's one, uh, yeah, there's, I think there's, if you look at them, there's um, three of the 20 polls are not in the inner city and 10 of the 20 actually have an address of Brisbane City, which is, you know, absolutely dead set in the city. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to find, the, uh, find out the uh, details. In fact, I'll confirm my views on climate monitoring uh, in the Wynnum. I'm sure it'll show that Wynnum's climate is much better than the rest of Brisbane. Uh, cooler, in, in, apart from uh, Sandgate and though, cooler cooler in summer, warmer in winter, and uh, I'll also be interested in air quality monitoring. Uh, I think that's an important issue, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, data and what, what level of da data can be obtained from the polls uh, that, that put in Wynnum. Also, uh, I hope that they're going to put in something that's very much salt resistant, because the existing lighting poles along the Esplanade are having to be replaced lately because the, uh, the poles are all rusting. So. Uh, the, uh, so, the, the, as I said, as I said, it's something that we support. There, there is a, one of the other tenders. I think it's an automation group on page 12. It, it just uh, seems to be in a much lower price than, than the uh, price that was accepted. Uh, I think it was one million four hundred and twelve thousand five hundred and sixty-seven dollars, whereas the successful tender was two million and ninety-nine thousand three hundred. So perhaps the chair could uh, comment on that. Uh, the difference is uh, thirty-three percent. In relation to item E, the uh, Anzac Square uh, uh, works, uh, look, uh, I don't know what Councillor Schrinner was talking about because uh, we see this as another cost blowout. It's, uh, it was Green Camp Road last week and it's uh, Anzac Square this week. Every week that Councillor Schrinner's here, it's a cost blowout every week. It was 42% on Green Camp Road, now it's 23% on Anzac Square. And of course, in the this administration, they've had 47 million and counting on Kingston Smith Drive and 27 million on Tech One. So they're all adding up. As I said last week, uh, here a blowout, there a blowout, everywhere a blowout, blowout. And uh, Mr Chair, uh, we've been told previously this project was mainly funded by the state government and uh, I hope councils will not be trying to lumber the state government with the blowout costs, but I wouldn't put it past them. Further speakers, Councillor Maddox. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I rise to speak in regards to item C, which is the storeboard submission for animal management services. Um, this is an important service the Council uh, provides to all Brisbane residents uh, across a, a variety of different areas. Um, currently, uh, the contract is set to expire in October of this year, and so uh, it's important that we undertake this process to uh, continue this service. As the current arrangements provide, there are three key services, management of the animal rehoming centres, animal collection services and 24-hour livestock impounding. Now, um, currently we have the Animal Welfare League of Queensland has managed councils to animal rehoming centres located at Brackenridge and at Willawong. Um, and we have Brisbane Livestock Control, which provides all services required in relation to animal control services, including 24-hour-a-day uh, stock impounding, priority animal collections uh, and emergency uh, uh, impounding as well. So the new uh, contract um, continues to provide that service, but also looks at other opportunities. And this is an important part of this process to see how uh, we can continue to provide an even higher level of service to Brisbane residents around these key issues. Um, and the proposed tender document will include the following services, management of the animal rehoming centres, animal collection services, 24-hour livestock, and importantly also a new service, the care of animals and evacuation centres. 
So this new category is being added from disaster management uh, care uh, for animals at evacuation centres during a disaster event, such as flooding, severe weather, uh, wildfire. There is currently an informal arrangement with uh, the Animal uh, League Welfare, uh, sorry, the Animal Welfare League, uh, to care for animals during times of disaster. But it's important that we put this service in uh, as a formal way of being able to provide that level of certainty uh, to the council, but also uh, to uh, all of those people out there that may be affected during uh, disaster times uh, with the care of their animals. I think it's an important addition to the service that uh, for people who are obviously going through uh, challenging times, uh, not only uh, financially, physically, emotionally, uh, who may be impacted by a disaster, to have the emotional, uh, to have the added emotional impact of uh, the care and uh, welfare of their uh, pets uh, is something that uh, no one needs, and I think that this uh, will be a valuable addition uh, to that service. And so, as council uh, as council operates the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week service. This specification has been updated to include the collection of dogs being held by members of the public after hours. Um, this, and at the moment, uh, that will be uh, an improvement on, on the operating hours in regards to what that offers uh, so that we can uh, provide an even higher level of service. The, uh, specifi sorry, the specification document uh, has been uh, updated uh, to also include animals uh, via the roadside or being held by members of the public. Uh, which, which are then scanned for a microchip and the owner, of course, immediately contacted. Um, we're also introducing, uh, uh, based on feedback, uh, uh, payment options for uh, people, uh, for, and including the introduction of afterpay or zip pay uh, options to assist owners who cannot afford upfront impound fees. So all of these things are continuing to enhance the service, not only uh, from the accountability and protection uh, and, uh, and return of animals that are collected, but also the financial obligations on those people. Uh, and there are instances at our uh, rehoming centres where people are under financial difficulty, where they would love to be able to collect their dogs. Being able to provide these other financial services is just one further example of how council is working for the community and listening to the needs of the community, not only uh, in the care of their animals, but also the financial impacts that they may be going through and ensuring that we provide flexibility and options for people at all times. So this will be uh, an important uh, procurement process. Um, it's important that we get it out there. I hope that there are a number of providers out there. As all councillors know, and Councillor Cummings does as well, I mean, he runs the same line, but the reality of the situation is that in specialised services as this, there are very few operators, providers across not only Brisbane, but the state, uh, and we're not the only council that uh, utilises these services. We all go through this process. We love to see competition. We love to see options provided and enhancement of services. But in some instances, there are very few operators who provide this specialist service. Uh, but we shall wait and see, uh, Mr Chair, uh, what options are available out there. But again, this is an important service. and We continue that strong commitment to all ratepayers to continue to provide it. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just ask that um, at the outset that a, item A and B be taken seriatim for voting together as a block. All right, I'm going to repeat that to you, that items A and B be taken for voting purposes uh, together. Together. So together. then together. C, D, E together as well, separately. Um, I'll, I'll just talk uh, very briefly on item C, uh, the um, uh, contracting plan for animal management services, uh, and on item A and B as well. Uh, and um, uh, I know uh, the Leader of the Opposition has uh, spoken about uh, the Animal Welfare League uh, and the uh, contract process, and it is disappointing that uh, in uh, these sort of contract uh, um, tenders, tenders for contracts, uh, that there is only one um, uh, you know, tenderer, one organisation putting their hand up for that. Uh, do accept that, Councillor Maddock, that this is particularly specialised, and there were there was interest from other organisations as well, and they had a look at it. Uh, and ultimately, the Animal Welfare League of Queensland was the only one to um, uh, put in a tender, and were successful. Uh, and I uh, want to congratulate them. They operate the uh, uh, rehoming centre, the Warra Rehoming Centre, um, just a couple of metres uh, out of my um, ward boundary. There um, have had I have had quite a lot to do with the Warra um, Animal. Uh, shelter in my time uh, before council and uh, now as a councillor, uh, 
uh, and with the Animal Welfare League of Queensland. Uh, I've run a number of uh, fundraising events uh, with them. Uh, next one coming up on June 15 at Decker Park. Mark that in your diaries. Our dogs day out in the Deegan Ward. Uh, we've raised a few thousand dollars for the Animal Welfare League and the work that they do and um, the model that they have and the council has pursued uh, with them in a much more um, uh, humane treatment of animals uh, and their commitment to not destroying animals that can be rehomed somewhere, uh, whether it's within the city of Brisbane or elsewhere, uh, is a very noble thing. Um, so I certainly, certainly support that. Uh, on uh, to uh, item A, the major amendment to the city plan, the package for aged care. And the Lord Mayor got up today and uh, made out as if uh, this package is the one that they proposed uh, to the people of Brisbane and to the state government uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, it's a you know, pretty small change, very sensible and all that. Uh, but we know uh, that the administration and this LNP administration's uh, real desire uh, when it comes to development and the development industry uh, is in Brisbane is let it rip. Uh, that's what they like to see when it comes to development. Uh, we know what they wanted to see, particularly around uh, low-density residential areas, and it took a concerted effort and campaign by residents right around the city uh, and by councillors on this side of the chamber uh, applying pressure to this administration uh, to wind back those provisions uh, which would have enabled uh, these multinational corporations, uh, these private providers um, for full profit coming into communities uh, and whacking up high-rise developments uh, right in low-density residential areas. So we know that um, the administration didn't have the courage of its own convictions uh, and backed down on that, which is good, and we commend them for that. Uh, but there are still some serious, uh, there are some elements we have serious concerns around in this package as well, uh, particularly the extra height uh, as of right uh, for a, a, a particular um, private developer, a particular industry as of right extra height uh, in the medium and high density zones. Uh, it should not be as of right. Uh, they should not um, be reduced uh, to code accessible rather than impact accessible, which takes away uh, the rights of the local communities uh, where they will be located to have a say about development. Now, we'll, we'll hear the, you know, uh, Councillor Burke probably get up and say, oh, they can still make submissions and all that jazz. Uh, but we know, if they know about it, that's right, Councillor Strong, if they know about it. Um, but what we know is the, uh, as it currently operates, if someone wanted to come in, uh, whether you have a neighbourhood plan in your area which specifies height limits or uh, height limits under the city plan. If someone wanted to put two extra stories right next to you, uh, they would have to apply to council and, and get uh, an application which would be classified as impact accessible, which means neighbours are not only notified, but they have rights to make a submission and appeal that. Uh, so what we're going to see uh, right across the city, and council coming rightly pointed out that it's not going to be. It's, it's not aged care. They're not nursing homes. We're talking about here. The the LNP councillors often throw that at us and say, "Oh, you 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 know uh, anti aged care and anti nursing homes." And what about people who need care in nursing homes? Uh, this isn't about nursing homes. We know they are uh, spaces for nursing homes are allocated and funded uh, by the federal government. So a private provider is not going to come along to council and say, "We'll take your infrastructure charge discount and whack up a nursing home." Uh, somewhere, whether it's Inogra or Sandgate or Maricravat, uh, they're not going to do that. They're going to find a site where they can make the largest profit. Yes. Now, they're already making large profits. We know that, uh, whether it's uh, private companies uh, or uh, church-run uh, companies, we know that they are generating significant income uh, for those companies. And what this administration wants to do is to hand out ratepayer money in subsidies to these private companies. Now, we know, true to form, like their state and federal counterparts, the LNP in this place wants to look after the big end of town. Yep. We know that when they go to the development industry, they must look through a big list of the development industry and say, who's the, who's the least worst off here? Because uh, we want to give them some free money, whether it's luxury, luxury, yeah, that's right, there's corporate welfare, it's luxury hotels that get the free money, it's, uh, it's student accommodation developers who you know, cram, cram international students into shoeboxes, they get the free money, and it is multinational corporations uh, that build uh, for-profit retirement, retirement villages, not aged care, retirement villages, that are going to get some free money there. So we have some significant concerns around uh, the way in which this council treats development. It's all about trust. I think 
their track record uh, when it comes to development uh, in this city, whether they've wound back some of the, the very worst uh, of, this, um, of this amendment or not, uh, it's about trust. And you know, you've got to ask the question, do we think the people of Brisbane trust this administration to stick to their word? No. I think uh, we're pretty confident in saying the, the, when it comes to development and so many other issues, but particularly development in this city, that trust in council has been eroded significantly. And it, it is amendments like this which give these developers, as of right, extra height um, if they want, gives them free money. Uh, gives them extra uses, as Councillor Cummings said. Those, those, they can set up basically shopping centres in these places as well. Uh, that uh, gives this advantage to those developers that no other developers uh, would have ever got. So they've demonstrated time and time again uh, they can't be trusted when it comes to development in this city. Uh, when it comes to those infrastructure charge discounts, it is important to note, and Councillor Cumming uh, talked about this, those charges that we are now going to be discounting if this administration uh, uh, pursues that, um, uh, discounting as infrastructure charges, uh, we already know uh, in the years ahead we're going to have a $1 billion deficit mm -hmm. when it comes to funding through development for the required infrastructure of development. So that means we're going to have to find an extra billion dollars in rates over the next few years to fund the infrastructure that is yeah, very basic and required just as a result of increasing population in our suburbs. So the extra roads and footpaths we need, uh, the extra drainage we need and parks and community facilities and sporting facilities that we need just to keep up with the increasing development and increasing population. We're already going to be a billion dollars short and this administration thinks the right course of action is to give free money to multinational development corporations. So they have their priorities all wrong, Mr Chair. When it comes to uh, item B, the Gap Neighbourhood Plan, uh, this is uh, one sorry saga for the residents uh, in the Gap. The Lord Mayor said um, just a moment ago that um, oh, the people there didn't really want much change, we don't do much change there, uh, except for when you tried to force uh, high density developments on the residents of the Gap in the Gap Village uh, in the first draft neighbourhood plan. Um, so again, who what was that, Councillor Toomey? Uh, well, you'll have, your, you'll have your opportunity very shortly. Uh, those five-storey developments uh, in the Gap Village that people didn't want, yeah, fair enough, you've had to back down. The protection rackets for the, uh, for the LNP councillors is in full swing when it comes to neighbourhood plans. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see. There's a few other, a few other neighbourhood plans coming through this place uh, over the coming months and uh, years, although they won't be here for the ones uh, coming in the years ahead uh, with any luck. Um, uh, but uh, when it comes to... When it comes to uh... <laughs> councillors, will be heard in silence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When it comes to again uh, trust, uh, can you trust this administration when it comes to planning uh, and development in this city? Uh, and the answer is no. The answer is no. You cannot because. Uh, this is certainly a neighbourhood plan that uh, wouldn't win the, uh, the phantom award that this uh, administration likes to talk about when it comes to neighbourhood planning. Uh, there are provisions around character Councilor protection Cassidy. that haven't been Councilor met in transport Your and traffic. Expired. Further speakers? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to uh, briefly speak on item A and uh, item B in the agenda. Uh, item A. Uh, Mr Chairman, my ward has a, an ageing demographic. Uh, at the moment, Community Profiles has it listed at about 16 per cent of the residents in my ward are over the age of 65. We have some streets and cul-de-sacs in uh, certain parts of the ward where there's just the ladies of the house that remain. Um, the families have moved elsewhere within the gap and their husbands have passed away. So, I actually believe that this package would serve the residents of my ward, uh, should the opportunity arise. In general terms, very few of my residents actually leave the ward. They move internally. They chop and change between two-storey houses, single-storey houses, uh, small lots, large lots, depending on their circumstance uh, in life. And I dare say that would be common to most wards around the city. 
where we give our residents the opportunity of choice for them to choose the way they wish to live for their current circumstance in life. But this particular package offers uh, something quite unique. It offers people of Brisbane to actually reside in their own area, uh, near their families, near their doctors, near their friends, uh, near to the health services and health practitioners um, that they've always had. It provides a level of familiarity and a level of certainty uh, around, let's say, you know, the winter years of life. It also allows, uh, as I said before, choice. Uh, elder residents in my ward particularly are looking for somewhere where they can stay close to their friends, they can stay connected to their sporting clubs, uh, they can stay close to all the facilities that they're normally um, grown up with or, or always had there. They like to be, have things convenient and accessible and this package provides the ability for those conveniences and that accessibility for them. So I'd encourage councillors here to support uh, item A. On item B, where do I start? Uh, I might start off by saying that the, the leader of the opposition, I think, has completely missed his calling in life uh, and that maybe we should consider an introduction to the Brisbane Comedy Club. But um, anyway, that's for another time. On his point, uh, Waterworks Road congestion. Well, let me speak to that for a moment uh, since you brought it up. Uh, Waterworks Road congestion is a contribution of a lack of upgrade to the Gympie Road and Met Road 5. Uh, this was well documented on Steve Austin on ABC Radio. And I hear Councillor Griffith scuff in the background. But I do believe the debate on radio went for over half an hour. So it's well documented that there is heavy congestion or perceived heavy congestion, heavy congestion running through my ward as a result of the state Labor government not providing an upgrade to Metro 5 or to Gympie Road. And, and Councillor Griffiths, rail fail. And I'll tell you why rail fail is not working, because when residents go to catch the train, it's not there. When they get home, it gets there late and their bus connection window has passed. So in terms of, in terms of uh, congestion, it's being caused by a lack of investment by the state government. But I should stand corrected. Yeah. I should actually stand corrected because I do know one thing that the state government has done around uh, Met Road 5, and that's traffic counts. They've done some traffic counts. In the last 20 years, they have done traffic counts. Pretty poor effort. Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, the neighbourhood plan is obviously the second neighbourhood plan for my area and on all accounts uh, and my experiences, and I believe that of the officers uh, and of the, the residents who did engage with council officers and myself, it was a pretty good experience. Uh, we had a conversation about uh, merging community land, we had a conversation about rezoning certain properties which was hinted to do by Councillor Cassidy there incorrectly. Uh, we had a conversation about our district centres and our shopping centres. We had a conversation about our sport and rec land and how we'd like to see that evolve and cater for new uh, sporting and recreation opportunities moving forward. We also had a conversation about overall what we would like to see happen in the future of the gap, in the short term and the long term. And we had conversations in a formal style. We had a conversations in kiosks and informal styles. Uh, we had them in shopping centres and we had them at the golf club. And they were pretty well attended, I thought. Uh, we had quite a few number of people from various backgrounds and various parts of the wards come in and to have a chat. One thing that actually excited me most, and I know Councillor Burke uh, will know about this, was the electronic map 
that we use to capture a whole heap of data from residents around the area. They could drop a pin on the map, highlight that pin, make a comment, add a photograph maybe, and all that data was captured to, to provide a holistic view of what residents would like to see uh, happen within the gap. Thank you, Councillor Cummings. It was very scientific and it was very successful. Your commentary this evening has been outstanding. Uh, that said, the minister has put through the amendment without any, any changes. And I have to say he's done the right thing in this case. Uh, this neighbourhood plan amendment truly reflects, I believe, uh, what, the, um, what the residents of the Gap Ward. But there is one thing left to do, and that is for the state government to agree to the TLPI that council has requested. That's still left to do, and that affects all wards. And to that end, I have written to the member for Cooper, urging her to uh, make representation of the people that she has in her ward to, min to Minister Dick uh, and do as much as she can. And I'd like to table that letter, if I may, please, Billy. Thanks, mate. I would like to thank the LM. Uh, I would like to also thank Councillor Burke. I would like to thank the councillor, council officers, uh, because in this particular neighbourhood plan, the second one that was done in my ward, uh, they've done some very innovative things to capture uh, the data around what residents are thinking, what they're seeing and what they'd like to happen. And I would, I would really uh, encourage the use of the EMAP to move forward. I think it was a wonderful tool, uh, even the fact where residents could come into the shopping centre and do it on a tablet within the shopping centre. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I would also like to, put, uh, like to have a big thank you to the residents of the Gap Ward, primarily because they were engaged. They got involved. We had a wide-ranging demographic represent our CPT team. We had large numbers of people come up to, and talk to us uh, in the shopping centres. They attended the golf clubs and without their high level of engagement, we really wouldn't have this wonderful amendment uh, before us today. So I really want to thank uh, the members of my community who took time out during the week and during weekends to come along and have a chat and uh, provide their point of view and show some leadership in the direction that they would like their community to go. Thank you. First speaker is Councillor Allen. Mr Chair, I move the Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Marks, so that the meeting adjourned for a period of 15 minutes, commencing only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And a contrary no. The ayes have it. The meeting is now adjourned.
Yes. <coughs> Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on items A, B, D and E. Um, and I just ask that item D is taken uh, seriatim for uh, voting purposes. I'm going to repeat that back to you, that you'd like item D taken separately for voting purposes. Yes, please. D, yes. Uh, yes, I'd just like to start with um, uh, E, um, which is the contract variation for the Anzac Square uh, stage four landscaping. Now, this project has just been so badly handled um, by council. Uh, this is the stage that was supposed to be finished by Remembrance Day 2018. So that's some six months ago. Um, the Deputy Mayor, now Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner, uh, stood up earlier this year, I believe it was, uh, and said that it was due to be finished well, I think, actually, I'll take that back. On the 17th of January, a council spokesperson said it would be finished by the end of January, um, and that didn't happen. And then um, after that, the uh, councillor Shrino, the new Lord Mayor, when he was deputy mayor, said that it was all gonna be finished by Anzac Day. So this stage, which was supposed to be completed um, in June 2018, council has let slip past Remembrance Day, past Anzac Day, um, and now we're being asked to approve further contract variations um, to what is an extremely important commemorative site within our city. Um, it is just like every other project that this LNP administration undertakes. It's just gone bad because the, the leadership of these projects is not being handled well. Um, this is an important commemorative place, um, and the fact that it is still not finished after um, so many delays already, I think is an indictment on this administration. And I mean, I can't really see a final finish date in here anyway, not that I would believe it, given it was supposed to be June and then it was gonna be January and then it was gonna be April. So what's it gonna be now? Um, you can't um, trust them to deliver on these projects. Um, and honestly, to stuff up something as important as Anzac Square, I think reflects quite poorly on this council. Just with respect to the uh, smart polls, um, look, we, we, we had a rather odd briefing this morning about this. Um, it struck me it was more about show and show rather than tell. Um, and uh, Councillor Cooper put it in a special room and we got a sort of midget version of one of the smart polls uh, brought in and set up, which must have just been a huge amount of effort and um, uh, you know, cost and complexity to all the council officers and the contractor, whoever it was, we don't know because that's a secret, um, to, uh, to do. But the tell part was the problem of Councillor Cooper's show and tell this morning. Um, and there's just a few things that I, I'd like to note about the Smart uh, Polls project. Firstly, um, it seems a little bit redundant to me. Um, Yes, there is some new functionality going into the smart poles. Um, I don't know that council provides USB ports anywhere in the city, but perhaps they do. Oh, they do? Okay, so we do have existing street lighting. We do have existing coloured street lighting. We do have existing pedestrian and cycle monitoring points. We do have existing free Wi-Fi. And Councillor Shree is just saying to me there are some free Wi-Fi points around the city. I'm not, I'm not aware of those myself. Um, so I'm just not, I'm not, what I don't understand about this project is how it adds value to the suite of initiatives that Brisbane City Council has. It seems to be a standalone piece of technology that looks you beaut and great, but doesn't integrate with our existing um, systems that we already have. And to my mind, um, in planning the rollout to um, upgrade the services that we offer to our community, we should be looking to integrate um, addition, additional functionality into uh, it, it, the technology that is out there already. Now, the reason I say this is because there are 20 locations, um, of which the vast majority of them are in the CBD yes. or the Valley, um, which all already have things like free Wi-Fi, public lighting, coloured lighting, USB ports, all the other things that these new smart poles are going to do. Um, and when I asked the question this morning about why the existing 
technology wasn't adequate, I, didn't, I don't believe I got a good answer. I got, well, they won't be replacing technology that's already there. Apparently, these things are modular, so they're going to be even smaller in some places. Um, so it won't replace the existing technology, but it'll go where there's black spots. Well, you know, we've already got free Wi-Fi right across the CBD, to my knowledge, and in um, the Botanic Gardens, and in the Valley, and in the Valley Mall. Um, I do not understand why we're looking at that kind of technology offering in locations where it's already delivered. Then you take the idea of these 20 locations, 16 of them are on the north side, four of them are on the south side. So yet again, the south side is being dutted by this administration. Two of them are in Kangaroo Point. Um, so um, essentially, um, there is extremely little on offer, not only outside the CBD, um, but on the south side generally. So I understand the need to try and offer um, better services to the residents of Brisbane. My concern here is the smart poles don't necessarily seem to be the most integrated way that we can do it. I think residents will also be very concerned about the surveillance um, that will be undertaken uh, through the CCTV cameras that will operate um, and how that information will be used. It will be collected by a private provider. Who knows what they're going to do with it? Are we going to write into our contracts that they're not allowed to give it to anybody else? I don't know. Um, are we going to share it with the police, ASIO? Who are we going to share it with? I don't know. Um, uh, are we integrating in cameras into locations where the police already have surveillance? As far as I know, we also have surveillance, CCTV surveillance in the malls and in key CBD locations. So to me, this project does not make sense. It seems to be redundant because we already have an offering across the locations that we're talking about here. And very clearly, um, the project manager said during committee um, that it wasn't about replacing what was already there. So why are we putting it in twice in the same location? That, that is fundamentally what is unclear to me. Uh, just briefly on the um, aged care uh, package. The damage that this administration has done by allowing uh, retirement village developers to build in areas of the city well beyond what is allowed under the planning scheme has just been appalling, absolutely appalling. In my ward, for example, council has allowed um, developments, private developments, uh, that are four up to seven storeys, and that is in low density areas, in character low density areas, uh, that's at Chelmer. Uh, it's allowed six storeys uh, adjacent to low density down in uh, Corinda. And I doubt the councillor who was uh, the councillor when that happened um, spoke up and said, oh, I don't think that's right, Councillor Burke. Uh, he would have been all for it. Um, but meanwhile, you've got character low density area and it's now got six storey retirement village overshadowing these beautiful character houses. Over in Yoronga, there's seven storeys, um, and that was an industrial area that's been converted, but it floods. And this is an area where council refuses to put in the infrastructure that is needed um, to support aged care. So from my mind, this aged care plan is all wrong. Um, you cannot just look at development in isolation. Unless this administration is going to invest into the infrastructure and services that elderly people need to live in their communities, they are locked into that location. And that is what has happened at Yoronga. And there's seven petitions that have been brought to this place, and we're waiting for the seventh to come through. They can't even cross the road. There's 400 plus units there now, and there is no safe crossing point. This is a developer that, even with the subsidies and the discounts that he's got, has paid over $3 million in infrastructure charges to council. Is any of that being invested back into the things they need in the local area to support them? No, it is not. Simply treating um, ageing as a development issue is wrong. That is where this strategy has gone wrong. It is about lifestyle. It is about supporting the care needs that residents uh, need. There are 107,000 people waiting for a federal government aged care package. That is not about living in a retirement village. That is about health care and support so that they can live. 
That is the carers, the personal carers, the occupational therapists, uh, the people who come and help them in their homes. Um, that might be a high care nursing bed um, down the track. None of what we are talking about here is targeted to help people who are vulnerable and frail in our community. It is all about development, and that is where this council has gone fundamentally wrong. Um, it is not suitable for its purpose, and councils should just be scrapping this and looking at it. I even had a lady come up to me recently um, at a local event I was at and talk to me about why council hasn't looked at more innovative solutions like um, smaller homes being used for um, aged care people. Uh, I'm not supporting this, but I'm just saying this, uh, smaller homes being used. So you might have a share arrangement with a communal nurse or a communal uh, OT. Um, so they can still live in a home environment, still live in their community. I mean, there's been no innovative look at what we need here. Um, this is simply about allowing development and a development approach to aged care, which is the exact opposite of what these people need. So I don't support this. Um, I think that this council um, has absolutely got this wrong and that we should, if we're doing anything, we should be working more closely with the federal government to look at the care needs for elderly people in our community. I mean, I've been doing Meals on Wheels for such a long time, and I know other councillors do as well, or have done in the past, and every week I see vulnerable people living in their homes without the support they need. They can't afford to go into a for-profit retirement village that costs $800,000. Um, this council should be looking at what we can do to work with other levels of government to support in-home care uh, for those residents or supported um, care where they need it. And this um, aged care plan does nothing uh, to address those issues. The speaker's Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I rise to speak on the ENC item C, Stores Board Submission for Animal Management Services. Um, look, I just want to um, acknowledge uh, the Disaster Management and uh, the Preparedness Team uh, for their efforts um, in going about and including um, the new category uh, for the care of animals at evacuation centres, um, which I'm sure most of this uh, chamber would know that Pullen Vale Ward being surrounded by the Brisbane River, but also the mountains. Uh, does consistently have issues with flooding. Even when we have a standard rain event here in Brisbane, um, the ward does um, actually get some substantial flooding. So it's great to see that this new category has actually been included. Um, yes, it is a very specialist area, but what I know is for our evacuation centres that were isolated, um, we did have a lot of um, different types of animals from your normal uh, Home, home pets, but also to cattle and, and horses and different um, calibre of those animals as well. So I just want to acknowledge uh, that it's on and uh, thank um, the Brisbane City Council officers for, for considering the needs of the evacuation centres, but also for the community that need to, to know that their animals are going to be looked after, even though they may not be there themselves. So thank you, Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on two items: items A, the aged care amendments, and item B, the GAP plan. I'm going to start off uh, first with the GAP plan uh, and just respond to Councillor Toomey, who spoke earlier today. And um, you notice he, or I noticed, he was talking about Waterworks Road. Yes, Waterworks Road, that great problem with congestions and delays uh, for the residents of, uh, that he represents. And it was interesting to hear him blame everyone else. Yeah. It's the state's problem. It was Gympie Road's problem. It was rail fail. It was buses. God only knows. It was everyone else's problem. So what we need to remember is... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order against you, Councillor Griffiths. Misrepresentation. Councillor Note your uh, claim to be misrepresented. Councillor Griffiths, please. Yes, thank you. Um, obviously hit a nerve there. What we do know and what this is code for is that Councillor Toomey is a politician who won't be doing anything about Waterworks Road. This is a councillor who's holding up the white flag and flying it and blaming everyone else. This is a politician and this is a politician who's playing lots of politics with this game. So I think um, I know I went to numerous anti-zipline meetings numerous, and I, I never saw Councillor Toomey at one. I never heard him speak in this chamber about 
against the zip line, but suddenly he's the hero of the people because he's against the zip line. <laughs> oh, this is another one, I suspect. Okay, well, let that one sit to the side because it's interesting when you've been in this place a while, you get to see how these LNP councillors operate and how this LNP mayor, and let's face it, they've been here 16 years, how they operate. The second one was aged care. And um, look, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming have very effectively said we don't support this amendment, and we don't support it for a few reasons. Uh, the first one is that it's code accessible. Why, oh why, can't the people of Brisbane have a say in this? Why is it uh, that they are being excluded from having a say about these facilities near them? Second thing is. Um, it's heavily ratepayer subsidised through lack of infra infrastructure charges. Once again, I think uh, the word was mentioned before, developer, developer, developer. This LNP administration love developers. And that's why they use so much of our residents' money to support developers. And it is really questionable whether we should be putting our ratepayer money into uh, private developments or into subsidising uh, developments when we can't even save our bowls clubs. We can't even find the money to save our bowls clubs, but we can hand over a whole lot of cash to developers. Uh, something is wrong here. And the other thing that is a big furphy in all this is most of these aren't aged care homes. They aren't aged care homes. And, and in particular, the one at Tarragindia. I want to raise this point because I suppose this is the point that has the most bearing for me that I've observed. And I did hear Councillor Johnston talk about its impact on her ward. Well, I, I used to represent Tarragindi, and um, residents of Tarragindi are very angry. Uh, they're very angry that they've been sold out. And they've been sold out because they're copying um, on land zone sport and rec, they're being, and they're in a low density area. Low density, so just two story homes. They're copying a five story um, development of over 90 units that was supported by the local councillor. Uh, it, was all, it was also a result in, I need to correct, I said there was the Bowls Club before had totally gone. No, only one of the Greens has totally gone. So um, what we have for the residents of Tarragindi is their councillor supported a high rise in their suburb that is not near infrastructure that will add uh, over 90 units to their suburb, uh, and the council supported it. The council actually argued against residents when the residents were protesting. I know, because I was there at those public meetings. So I suppose my question for the council, Councillor Adams, is are you going to write to the residents of Tarragindi now, when you told them what a great thing this was and how you supported it, are you going to write to them now and tell them that this change has come through and actually, um, if someone was applying to that development now, they wouldn't be getting it? Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell them that? Yeah. Um, because they have a right to know that. Because um, those residents feel very underrepresented by their councillor and feel that their councillor sold them out to a developer who's very keen on making money out of their community. And as well as that, they lost a bowls green. So, Madam Chair, I, I think this, oh, Madam Chair, I keep going back to uh, Aunt Councillor Owen Taylor, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, what we have here with these amendments is a lot of backpedalling by the LNP. It's a lot of backpedalling by the LNP who know that the people out there in Brisbane land are really worried about the sheer amount of overdevelopment that this LNP administration have allowed and have voted for and have condoned for so long. And they want the balance corrected. And I think this move is a little uh, too little, too late. Thank you. Councillor Toomey, your claim to be, your claim to be misrepresented. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Also, before you begin, Councillor Toomey, please keep your comments to the, the misrepresentation. Please don't relitigate your argument. Uh, I, I did uh, mention in my earlier speech uh, that um, 
the, tr the increased traffic through Morton Regional Council was an issue, rail file was an issue, the lack of state government investment on Metro 5 was an issue, and also in Gympie Road. I did not mention the buses. Further speakers? Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I rise to speak to uh, item C briefly and item D. Can I just in particular say, and I echo the comments uh, of Councillor Cassidy, that the Animal Welfare League uh, do a fantastic job at the Wara Animal Rehoming Centre. Uh, they are someone, that the way that they conduct themselves is exemplary. Uh, and certainly I spend a lot of time down there myself. Uh, it is something that I've absolutely to be commended, the different initiatives that they have um, been able to put forward, different um, events at different times of the year, uh, the clearing out of the, uh, of the refuge at Christmas to try and say to people, take a dog or a cat home, give them a special break over Christmas, which has really created a lot more people willing to actually adopt these um, beautiful animals. So I think that they do a fantastic job. Uh, I think they do such a fantastic job that my dog was actually from Wara Rehoming Centre, the creature that has changed my family's life. Um, we adopted from there and he is a wonderful, a little bit crazy uh, addition to the family, but we absolutely do appreciate the fantastic work that they do. Uh, with respect to item D, the smart poles, uh, we actually had a display at committee this morning. Uh, it was thought that it would be a good opportunity for people to actually look at them, um, reading about them. It doesn't really explain how they are proposed to work. Uh, it is a process that we have been underway for some time. We went out to tender last year in July. Uh, that was closed in September. We received 12 tenders. We had a, a lot of interest in providing this particular facility. Uh, the officers reviewed that and it was then shortlisted to six. Uh, and then we went undertook further evaluation of those six tenders, uh, which was completed in November. Now, Councillor Cumming asked a question about one of the particular uh, six shortlisted um, ones, and he was wondering why we hadn't proceeded because he um, considered that it was actually a, a cheaper proposed one. So that, I understand, was the automation group proposal, if that's correct. Uh, so that. Council actually did go back to that shortlisted uh, tenderer. Um, we asked for further detail to understand that they could confidently uh, meet Council's objective and that it had um, really satisfied all of our requirements. And unfortunately, we didn't get um, we didn't get a response that gave Council confidence that those issues could be satisfactorily uh, responded to. So that is why that was not uh, was not a successful one. Is my understanding? That's the advice. I received from Point officers. of order, Mr Chair. Point of order against you, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Shree. Just on the same item, will Councillor Cooper take a question? Councillor Cooper, would you take a question? Yes. Thanks. I'm, forgive my ignorance. I'm just keen to understand wh where does the third party um, revenue generation come from? I wasn't at the presentation this morning. Councillor Cooper. I can give you a bit of detail. Uh, so basically, they are providing this asset for council, and part of the actual um, the, the contractor gets access then to the poles for the location of small cells for 4G and future 5G equipment across the city. So uh, part of this offer means that they will have that access for those specific different um, initiatives going forward. So, uh, in particular, you, can, you saw that um, there was a question about the data being received. So, there is specific data that will be received by council, uh, and it has to be ensured that it is used for planning purposes and, of course, in accordance with all relevant legislation. So, we've put in contractual arrangements in place to safeguard that data and make sure that the vendor is aware of their responsibilities and are contractually obligated to detect protect against and report on any malicious activity. So there's a lot of safeguards that this particular infrastructure is requiring council to be, um, council be very much uh, vigilant about. We will also conduct our own ICT risk assessment during the design stage of the project to ensure all risks are mitigated and understood prior to launch. So the proposed supplier any hub uh, is proposing to build, operate and maintain the smart poles for a period of 10 years. Uh, once we have made a decision in the chamber today, the contract will then be executed and the construction to install the smart poles is expected to begin in July of this year to be operational by the end of the year. 
with each of the 20 sites proposed for the first stage. So just to be clear, and we discussed it at committee uh, this morning, this is the first stage rollout. Uh, we anticipate there will be, if it is found to be a success, that council uh, is very keen to uh, look to in future roll out further uh, smart poles, and we will be um, undertaking all of the works to review and consider future sites. So each pole will require civil services for power and communication service at the base of each pole. The Lord Mayor highlighted that some of the functions of the poles will be uh, features including Wi-Fi, potentially uh, charging for your phone or mobile phone or laptop, counters for cyclists and pedestrians, LED street lighting, decorative lighting. There are a plethora of different things that these particular poles can actually deliver. I'll list off a few extras. So um, we talked about creative lighting. Uh, there's also pedestrian and bike detection. So it's specifically not just about counting people as they go past, but it's about getting the origin and destination of bike and pedestrian movements, including time of use, direction of travel and intersection information. This uh, information will be provided to, um, to TPO to use it to plan and better manage existing assets on the pedestrian and bike network. Uh, we will also be utilising it at the skate parks to get further data about the utilisation of those particular facilities. We will be using it for environment noise monitoring, so to monitor traffic and potential construction site noise for environmental survey purposes only. Uh, we will have climate monitoring devices to capture and monitor a variety of general climate, weather and physical parameters. This is to be sought for general climate information and to assess the microclimate within the city, including the impacts of buildings, vegetation, shade and surface materials Point of on order. microclimate. Sorry to interrupt again. Point of order against you, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Shree. Will, will Councillor Cooper take another question? Councillor Cooper, would you take another question? Yes, she will. Thanks. So just to clarify, I, I saw in the report that they don't have CCTV, but they do have cameras that are used by council. Is that correct? Councillor Cooper. They have the capacity to have CCTV cameras, uh, but council has another network, as, um, as this chamber is well aware. We have the CitySafe network, and that is the network that we will continue to operate in the CBD. Uh, in specific locations, for example, in the skate parks, there is still some discussion about whether we might um, use that capability in a specific location, but we would have to do a lot of notification in terms of um, warning to the community that there would be CCTV um, utilised in specific locations. So that has not yet been determined. It is a capability of these polls, but it is not something that Council at this point has opted to uh, incorporate in these particular polls. So just to be aware, they can do it, but we have not elected at this point to um, allow them to do that. So they, they are literally um, quite impressive, the amount of different facilities that they can uh, incorporate, uh, and they can be very much purpose-built for, for the specific location. So with the climate monitors, they provide information on ambient air temperature, barometer uh, barometric pressure, humidity, rainfall levels, sunlight levels, ground vibration, wind speed. We'll also be seeking to understand localised air pollution hotspots with the use of air pollution sensors. They will target areas to represent probable human exposure. They'll be looking at things such as particulate matter. Uh, as mentioned by the Lord Mayor, there's already locations that have public Wi-Fi. Uh, those, unless they need augmentation, will not be incorporated in those specific smart poles. But some locations, for example, escape um, poles are not serviced by Wi-Fi, and so the opportunities will be uh, undertaken in those specific locations. With respect to um, data uh, and the collection of that data, Council operates very strictly under provisions about um, people's civil liberties, and that will not change. These polls uh, will be uh, very much measured and considered to be an important asset in our community, but they are there for keeping the community safe and providing better facilities for the community in general. So these are very exciting new devices. They will provide real-time useful data for Council to help refine our planning for the delivery of projects and services. Uh, as I said earlier, we are looking for additional sites. Potentially, some of these sites may not prove to be suitable, but, so if there are councillors that have suggestions of locations that they would like to be considered in future, I urge them to please contact me and we will certainly put it on a list uh, for future. So please 
Uh, understand this is a pilot project. If it is successful, and I, I hope very much it is successful, I think it's got some great uh, benefits that it can deliver to our community. Uh, if it is proven to be so, then we will certainly be looking to roll those further out. And just to remind everyone that uh, we must operate under the Australian Communications and Media Authority Act, so we have very strict provisions under which we will operate, and this um, will certainly be the same exact arrangements that we will fully comply with with respect to these smart poles. So I would particularly like to say thank you to the officers. They have put a huge amount of work into these. Uh, not only do they look great and they are powder coated, so one of the one of the, the questions was, will they be resistant to an environment down at the beach? Uh, they have been used at uh, Sydney Harbour, so they are designed to be salt resistant. Uh, they are powder coated, which is a material that is very good in terms of dealing with those sorts of circumstances, but wear and tear is inevitable. Uh, and we will Cooper, certainly your time has expired. be looking forward to the smart polls. Thank you very much, right. Mr Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on <clears throat> the aged care amendments, the um, Gap Neighbourhood Plan and, and the smart poles. I might start with the smart poles. Um, I thank, thank Councillor Cooper through you, Mr Chair, for answering those questions. I guess, to be honest, I'm a bit disappointed that I wasn't offered a briefing prior to these decisions about locations being made. I understand that not 100 per cent locked in, but um, I think it's fair to say that this, these, this is a new thing. It's appearing in the public realm. It is going to cause some concern and controversy, um, and I, I mean, if if there are cameras on on these things, I, I think they they better be vandalism resistant and spray paint resistant as well, because you are going to have people who are frustrated about that encroachment of surveillance into public spaces. Um, reading through the information that's been provided, I was still a little bit sceptical and dubious as to whether they represent genuine value for money. I can see that they, the smart poles do offer a, a bunch of useful. Um, data collection features, but um, I can't help but wonder if this is really the best way to collect that data and, and the best use of ratepayer funds. I'm also a little bit sceptical about <clears throat> the, um, the downstream plans in terms of um, how much we're essentially renting out this space for versus how much revenue the provider will get down the track for um, subleasing space for, to telcos. Um, if the provider is willing, willing to pay us $10,000 a year for um, that benefit, presumably there's, a, there's another overhead that they're going to squeeze in down the track. So I know that there is a bit of concern in the community, particularly around phone cells and 4G and 5G. I don't want to get into that debate right now, but I, I think there needs to be some serious consultation and, and communication around this stuff ahead of time. Um, I'm, I'm not going to support this today. I, I just don't have quite enough information to be confident that this is a good use of funding. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing more data collected around air, air quality, etc. But um, as with any of this stuff, when we're collecting data about the citizenry and data that the residents themselves don't have direct access to, that creates a, a hierarchical relationship and a power imbalance. It might be another matter if that's open data that all residents are going to be able to immediately see and access, but based on this council's general track record, I presume that residents won't easily be able to log on and see the air quality data at these locations or immediately see the, the data on pedestrian counts and bike counts. So um, if we're serious about transparency and this, this is not just a creep in surveillance project in disguise, then it would be good for the administration to commit to the fact that all information collected through these surveillance polls is going to be made publicly available in real time to residents. I think that to me seems like a reasonable compromise. If we're collecting all this information in the public realm about residents in a manner that they don't have any control over, then the least we can do is provide that information transparently back to them. Um, I'm also just still a little bit confused as to how are we counting the pedestrians and bicycles if we're not using the cameras. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll hopefully the Lord Mayor will clarify that. I'm, I, I'm all for pedestrian and cycle counts. I think it's a shame that the council doesn't do more counts of, of pedestrians and bikes through major corridors. But I just wanted to clarify, if if it's a camera, it's a camera, right? Um, I'll leave it at that on that point. But um, turning to the Gap neighbourhood plan, I um, 
I understand there's been a lot of back and forth and a lot of discussions with residents. I think looking at this plan in some detail, the biggest concerns for me is still the missed opportunity to deliver any kind of community housing or public housing and the um, still a, a strong dependence on car or car dependency in that neighbourhood. And I would suggest that for this part of the city, that's still one of the biggest challenges for council is that residents by and large are still very dependent on car, private vehicles as their main mode of transport. And I realise that in a neighbourhood planning process, this is not a transport plan, this is a neighbourhood plan, but we still do have quite a few levers that we can and should be pulling to encourage active transport and public transport and minimise the need for longer distance car trips. So particularly when we think about land use, rather than simply zoning a few centralised commercial hubs that everyone has to drive to, we should be focusing more closely on hyper-localised small business opportunities where, pe where it's easier for people to set up corner shops and, and commercial and retail enterprises that are within walking distance of the majority of residents so that it becomes more commercially viable and more practical for residents to be able to access services and, and goods in their immediate local area rather than having to drive. And I don't think this um, plan really touches on that opportunity at all. It still seems to replicate some of the um, negative aspects of the worst kinds of suburban sprawl. Um, similarly, there's not as much emphasis as we might want or hope for in terms of supporting active and public active transport in particular. Um, the descriptions around streetscape seem to still presuppose a priority on, on cars and, and don't really focus on making it easier for people to walk around the neighbourhood and particularly for, for kids to get to local schools. Um, so I won't be supporting that item. I, I, I have to say I don't think it, this is the worst neighbourhood plan I've seen um, come through this place. There have been others that have been um, much, much worse, but I, st I still think this is a bit of a lost opportunity and that um, if we were more supportive of genuinely localising and decentralising our, our sub suburban communities, we'd, we'd be getting a lot more out of this approach. Um, long term, we need to move our city away from this idea of everyone commuting into the city centre and everyone having to get in and out along those main corridors. And a big part of that is land use planning. And I don't think we're really addressing that challenge in this particular document. We're still essentially reinforcing the idea of dormitory, dormitory suburbs um, that don't have enough job opportunities and community services located within them within walking distance. Um, turning to the amendments around aged care and retirement living, I must say, for a, for a political party that claims to be really supportive of free markets, you guys really, really love your ad hoc and poorly planned market interventions. Um, this, this is really reprehensible stuff. Um, and I understand that the administration might think it has noble goals, but this is a really ham-fisted and ineffective way to achieve the goal. Um, and, and what frustrates me is that there are, there's no criteria in this amendment to ensure that um, this is going to be affordable aged care or aged care for people on lower incomes. As other councillors have noted, you are incentivising and encouraging for-profit um, development of high-end retirement living in a way that isn't going to meet, meet the needs of the most vulnerable retirees in our community. Um, I, I must say that a lot of residents will be pretty shocked when they realise that there's just a straightforward density bonus of two storeys. and. Um, such generous discounts on infrastructure charges, the council is essentially painting itself into a corner and creating more challenges for itself down the track by allowing developers to produce for-profit stock without contributing to the necessary infrastructure in the local area. And I think um, some of the councillors in, in the LNP administration must surely understand that that's not a good long-term strategy, but I don't know why this administration is still pursuing it. Um, and it, it makes me really frustrated because this council is clearly demonstrating an intent to interfere with, with the market and prioritise and support certain kinds of development, yet co consistently refuses to do the same things for the most needed styles of housing, such as public housing and community housing. If you can give infrastructure debt discounts and density bonuses to encourage aged care or to encourage um, ho luxury hotels or to encourage student housing, why are you not doing the same thing for non-profit community housing? Why are you not taking any meaningful steps to incentivise and support the, the proliferation of public housing? This to me is really frustrating and I think shows that ultimately um, this administration's true allegiances are with the profit motives of those big developers 
rather wet than with the interests of low-income residents. It would have been very, very easy to t tweak this um, proposal so that it prioritised and encouraged affordable community housing that's targeted at low-income pensioners. And that opportunity has been missed, and, and I think it's a real shame because it will essentially drive up land values um, and, and make it harder for community orgs and, and government providers to deliver affordable housing through other mechanisms. Finally, I just might, might just note that the criteria around what satisfies the, um, the, the checkbox in terms of retirement living is very, very loose and very flexible. And I think there are genuine concerns the developer might seek a height bonus and might um, seek these exemptions in terms of infrastructure charges, but not actually be delivering that much retirement living anyway. Um, and I, I, it, it, it seems to refer only to um, gross floor area and a few other tokenistic checkboxes, but there's a lot, lot of wiggle room in there for a developer to disguise another kind of high-rise project as retirement living. And we've already seen examples of that along Annerley Road in Woolloongabba, where a developer has been given some very generous height exemptions on the basis that they're providing aged care, but then has um, not actually... Councillor Shree? I've still yeah. got 10 seconds left, but anyway. You, well, not according to our little timer, mate. Right, further speakers. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on right item E. These store boards items are to approve a contract variation for the landscape and building works, <clears throat> as well as architect architectural co um, consultancy for the Anzac Square Stage 4 project. As the Chamber will be aware, this project was a joint initiative between Council, State and Federal Governments. With the variations, the project remains on budget. There is no additional expenditure exceeding the approved budget being sought. There are a few reasons for the variations. Complying with the development approval conditions by the state government is a large contributor. Heritage conditions issued by the Queensland government impacted major build elements and resulted in post-market changes to the lift design, balustrades, elevated walkways and stairs. A variation of the provisional sum allowance relates to a higher than anticipated tendering cost for the bronze screens. The screens are a unique design and an incredibly uncommon project to have fabricated. Certainly an understandable variation in order to meet the heritage expectations of the square. The variation to the architectural consultancy amount primarily relates to the state development approvals conditions that resulted in design changes. Due to the significance of Anzac Square and the understandably need to deliver a high quality outcome, architectural contractors remained involved with the project longer than originally forecast. This was both to work through some changes of design details and ensure high quality construction standards. I would like to add that the square was totally open for Anzac Day and the comments that we received through the dawn service was absolutely positive. The quality of the square on Anzac Day speaks to the success of the enhancement works. I would like to close with reminding everybody, especially the Leader of the Opposition, that with the store board's approval variation, this project still remains under the approved budget. There was no overspend. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Chair. I just rise to enter the debate on item uh, A and B, uh, the uh, Gap Neighbourhood Plan and the Aged Care Amendments uh, that we have before us. Both of these items are uh, at their final stage. They have gone through uh, the full and rigorous process that is uh, the, either the changes to a city plan uh, through a major amendment or a neighbourhood planning process, uh, Mr Chair, and have gone uh, from this place uh, to the state for their final state interest check, and now they are back here uh, for our final approval. Uh, I'll just deal with the Gap Neighbourhood Plan. Uh, of course, for those who have uh, been in this chamber for a while, you remember that this is uh, a neighbourhood plan that was brought about by uh, the direction of basically the state government. Uh, let's not forget that apparently the appropriate thing to do with the TLPI is to TLPI a whole suburb uh, because the former member uh, for Ashgrove, the now member for Cooper, wanted a TLPI on the whole suburb of the Gap um, because that was a, a great planning outcome out there in the Gap that the state government would want to do. Of course, that's the way the Australian Labor Party like to do Point planning of order, in Mr. this Chairman. place. 
Good order again to Councillor Burke. Councillor yeah. Johnston. Councillor, Councillor Burke's deliberately misleading the chamber here. There was a petition of 2,000 residents from the Gap calling for a neighbourhood plan that I tabled in this place. Um, it had nothing to do with the state government. It was all from residents. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Councillor Burke. Thanks, uh, Mr Chair, for your protection again. Uh, so, as I was saying, um, we have gone about the neighbourhood planning process uh, out there in the Gap. Uh, this is a heavily constrained part of the city. Uh, it has got uh, two large uh, ridges on either side of it, uh, with the residents of the Gap living uh, through the section in the valley in between. Uh, it is constrained for both transport options uh, as well as access, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, and there was, through the process, uh, the opportunity to identify, identify some small additional uh, increase uh, in density around the shopping centre. And that is the way that you uh, go about a neighbourhood planning process. You look at those opportunities where density can be provided uh, around transport, uh, so the bus interchange at the, uh, the village there in Ashgrove, and also the services that are provided at that shopping centre uh, and the adjoining commercial uses uh, in that area. Um, and we put that out for consultation. And the residents said that five storeys was too much. Uh, and so we have scaled it back to two to three storey low to medium density residential. Uh, that is also, though, about providing housing choice um, because the gap is predominantly an older suburb. Uh, it has uh, traditional large blocks of land with single dwellings on them, uh, and there is not much choice in the housing stock available in the gap. Uh, and so just as we've done with other neighbourhood plans across the city, part of this is also making sure uh, that we have some choice and some options for people who wish to downsize in their local community. Uh, Councillor Toomey has played a very active role uh, in, in engaging with his residents, uh, in informing his residents about the neighbourhood plan, listening to his residents and making representations on behalf of his residents around their concerns uh, that they had uh, with the neighbourhood plan the whole way through the process. Uh, and Councillor Toomey has done a fantastic job of that. Uh, and so today we are finalising uh, this uh, neighbourhood plan. Uh, and I just want to congratulate and thank all the council officers that have been involved. Uh, it has been, as all neighbourhood plans are, a journey. Uh, and they've done a fantastic job uh, in bringing together this document. Um, Mr Chair, that turns to now the aged care um, amendment package we have before us today, which is also uh, in the final stages uh, of approval uh, if it's endorsed by Council uh, this evening. Um, there's a lot of interesting things that have been said in the debate uh, this afternoon, uh, which have been rehashed from when this item was here uh, earlier, uh, um, Mr Chair, uh, earlier this year, um, but there's nothing new from the opposition. The whole way through this process, actually not just through this aged care amendment package, but the whole time that I've been in this council chamber, right back to the Lord Mayor's task force into aged care, the Australian Labor Party has never put a single proposal on the table on how they would manage the changing demographic we have in our city. Nothing. They've never put up any proposals, no concepts, no ideas. What they have done is that every opportunity stood in the way of, being, of this administration helping to facilitate appropriate accommodation and the types of accommodation that we need in our city for the ageing population that we have. Whether it's over 50s, over 60s, those that need some care, those that need higher level of care and those that need the highest level of care, they have stood in the way of this administration delivering the appropriate facilities for our residents every step of the way without any contribution on what they would do different. And again today we saw it. Again today, we saw it. Councillor Cassidy was obviously zoning in on the federal election, trying to challenge, channel some of those key election messages from the federal election, uh, tackling on you know, the, the big end of town and uh, you know, all these sorts of things. Well, Councillor Cassidy, 85% of the aged care providers in this city are non-for-profit organisations. 85% of the aged care providers in this city are non-for-profit organisations. So they ain't the big end of town through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Cassidy. They are the people who are supporting our, our residents out there in the community. They're building these facilities, in many cases redeveloping existing facilities and making sure that we have the housing stock that needs to be available for our residents as they age. There's 19,000, nearly 20,000 extra over 65s in this city between 2011 and 2016. Where are they going to downsize to? Point of order. 
Point of order against you, uh, Councillor Burke. Uh, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Burke take a question? Councillor Burke, will you take a question? No, he won't take a question. Councillor I'll take Burke. that interjection because Councillor Johnson said they want to live in their homes. Well, no, they don't. Well, no, they don't. Because I tell you what, I know. I know. Well, you can keep interjecting all you like. I know because my mum doesn't want to live in her four bedroom home with two bathrooms and a double garage with just her and the small dog. She wants to downsize. We have this conversation on a regular basis that she wants to downsize, but there is no facilities in the certain part of Brisbane that she lives where she can downsize to and stay close to her friends that she's lived next door to for 40 something years. And Councillor Cummings, he argued for why this is a good thing because he said, oh, there's all these people from all over the place down in Wynnum when I go door knocking. Well, of course there is because there isn't the facilities in their local communities for them to stay in their local communities. So they have to move further afield. So they have to move to the Wynnums. They have to move to other parts of the city. They have to move even further afield than that. I know of one resident uh, who's had to put his mother up in the Sunshine Coast because that was the place where they could get a space for her. From the western suburbs of Brisbane to the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, good on you. Good on you, Australian Labor Party, supporting the most vulnerable in our community, doing what you do best, playing the politics over the people, always playing the politics over the people. The residents of Brisbane who have worked their whole lives here, who have lived in communities, who have contributed to those communities, who want to stay living in those communities, deserve our support. They deserve us to facilitate appropriate housing. They deserve the right to have good quality accommodation, whether it's aged care whether it's retirement living, whether it's high care in their local areas. Councillors on the other side went, oh, you're just increasing the height. Well, no, we're not. Because this, again, shows that they don't do the homework. They don't read the detail that's before us. Because while there is increases in the height, there's changes to the setbacks. So you can't have uh, one story, um, you can't have two stories greater within 20 metres of a common boundary. So you have to go back. So 10 metres for the first story, 20 metres for the second story. So you actually go back. Uh, there's changes to the code. So built to boundary walls are no longer, uh, would no longer be um, approved as part of this uh, change that we're putting forward. Side setbacks are increased from 1.5 to 4 metres. It's not about just changing the height. There's a whole pile of changes in this document that actually protect the amenity of the areas as well, where you see these developments interfacing with low density residential um, dwellings as well. But on top of that, I guess what was most galling in all of the debate that came through, actually, before I get to that, I'll deal with some of Councillor Shree's comments. Councillor Shree lamented the fact that we could have done more, that you know, we should be offering incentives, we shouldn't just be offering incentives, um, you know, we should be working with some of the, the businesses or some of the organisations that are actually um, working with some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. Well, apart from the work that we do with Brisbane Housing, Corporation uh, and the work that we do through our housing support programs uh, and the range of other initiatives that we do to help facilitate and support people who are living rough and or people who want affordable housing. Um, we also offer a 50 per cent reduction in infrastructure charges for non-for-profit organisations that are listed in the budget book. So we do offer that reduction already for those organisations and we are prepared to work with them as we do regularly. We waive pre-lodgement fees. We work with these organisations. So thank you, Councillor Shree, for giving me the opportunity to highlight the good work that we already do in supporting those organisations as well. But I guess what's most galling was um, this great confected outrage about who do you trust when it comes to tr development or who do you trust when it comes to aged care? Because the Labor Party have a sad track record when it comes to aged care. The Australian Labor Party are the ones who have stood in the way of this administration trying to make sure that we have good quality accessible aged care in our city. The Australian Labor Party are the ones who think it's okay up at 8, 80, 818 Berg. Rody Road Berg. to force Your four or five expired. storey aged care Council on Berg. four and a half hectares of bushland. Further speakers? There being no further speakers, I will put the... Oh, sorry, Lob Rider reply, Lord Mayor. Uh, just briefly, uh, Mr Chair, in particular, uh, this debate we had on aged care. Um, I think that uh, Labor councillors are stooping to a really new low um, in their claims today about this package. Because even Councillor Shree 
uh, mention that this is being done with the best of intentions, and it certainly is. It's being done to help uh, our older residents, our aged residents, whether they need retirement living or aged care. Um, and that is our motive here. That is our motive. And so uh, the attacks that uh, Labor councillors, particularly people like Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Griffiths, they are, as Councillor Burke pointed out, they seem to be getting a little bit too enthused about the federal election. Um, and they're channeling some of that rhetoric, um, which is just completely irrelevant to the situation we're talking about. We know that um, out in the ward offices, um, we get some interesting phone calls during um, full moon. Well, the federal election is like a giant full moon for the Labor Party, obviously. Um, they have gone off the deep end. But as Councillor Burke pointed out, a lot of the organisations who would be eligible for assistance and who would put forward uh, proposals for aged care and retirement, a lot of them are community-based charity organisations and churches. You know, we're talking about people like Anglicare, Blue Care, Catholic Health Care, Churches of Christ Care, the Greek Orthodox Community of St George, Holy Spirit Care, Lutheran Services, St Vincent's, Southern Cross Care, the Salvos, Wesley Mission, the Ethnic Communities Council of Queensland. These are the kind of organisations that do provide aged care in particular and that will experience some benefits on, uh, from what council is trying to do here. Yet the Labor councillors try and say this is about big end of town, multinational corporations, big business. It's just ludicrous. Uh, we're doing this because we care about our seniors and we want to help provide homes for them. That is as simple um, as our motives are, and that is exactly what this helps to achieve. As I mentioned, there's been several thousand new uh, homes created as a result of That's initiatives right. that Council has introduced to help uh, seniors find homes. And so uh, we support this. We make no apologies for supporting this. And it is a real shame that Labor has sought to play politics with this. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, <clears throat> I now will put the report for items A and B. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Vision. Vision called. Councillor coming. Councillor Strunk. Uh, I to my right, no to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 15 in favour, six against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. On item C and E. C and E, all those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. On item D, all those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Shreve. Division. Ayes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells.
Attendance, please close bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour and two against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Uh, I draw your attention to the Establishment and Coordination Committee Special Report, Lord Mayor, the Special Report. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the Special Report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 13 May 2019 be adopted. Seconded, Mr Chair. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the Special Report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 13 May 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate, Lord Mayor? Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order against you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Johnston. Uh, just ask that uh, item A be taken seriatim for debate and voting purposes, please. I'm going to please. repeat the two. Item A be taken seriatim for both debate and voting. Is that correct? Um, Lord Mayor, please make, make note and adjust your speech appropriately for that. So what we'll do, we'll deal with, we'll deal with item A first. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Um, item A relates to changes to committee memberships and uh, the, uh, there's a couple of changes to uh, the naming of committees as well. Um, it reflects the um, changes that occurred in Civic Cabinet in particular, uh, following the resignation of uh, Ryan Murphy from Cabinet. Uh, his replacement um, in the public and active transport portfolio by the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Adams, uh, but also um, the change that relates to, it's a, a little bit of a change that is a uh, back to the future change in some ways where economic development goes with public yes. and active transport, um, which in fact Jameson. has occurred in the past yeah. um, and uh, relates to particular chairs having a particular passion for economic development, um, as we know that, uh, as we know that Councillor Adams does, and as we know that other chairs in the past have had. Um, so uh, the other uh, change relates to uh, the appointment of Councillor uh, Adam Allen as the Chairman for Finance and Administration. Um, now Finance and Administration uh, was the name of the portfolio as well at one stage in the not too distant past. I remember it well, because I was the chair for finance and administration um, at one stage as well. Uh, so these changes reflect uh, the appointment of Councillor Allen to cabinet. And as I mentioned before, very capable deputy chair stepping up to the role of chairman of finance and administration. Um, uh, Councillor Allen has been involved in all of the uh, pre-budget meetings in the lead up to the creation of the next budget. Uh, he has been doing this role for quite some time now and is very uh, competent at this role and I have no doubt he will do a fantastic job as the Chair of Finance. Uh, and as will Councillor Adams in the role of public and active transport and economic development. Uh, one other minor change uh, and that once again relates to a particular Chair's passion and that is um, the arts. Uh, so community, the arts and lifestyle uh, will become the new name for lifestyle. And um, as Councillor Maddock is displaying, he's busting out of his um, bad shirt at the moment. Uh, with, <laughs> well, actually, that could have been taken in various ways. I didn't mean it in the negative way, but he's, he's, he's busting out his bad shirt rather than busting out of his bad shirt. <laughs> um, but Councillor Maddock is very passionate about our incredible creative communities and the arts uh, in Brisbane. And there is so much to be proud of and so much to uh, support. And I know that uh, Councillor Maddock will continue to be a great supporter of the arts, together with his other many responsibilities in that portfolio. So it's appropriate that, given that it is a sizable part of the role and such an important thing for the lifestyle of our city going forward, um, that the name be changed to better reflect what the portfolio involves. Um, so. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have this great situation where there are so many uh, talented people in the team um, and so many uh, members of the team that can easily step into new cabinet roles. Uh, there is a wealth of experience in this team 
Uh, there is also a wealth of cabinet experience in this team as well. And so um, uh, these new changes will help us deliver on our vision to build the infrastructure our city needs, um, to uh, deliver um, uh, the protection of our lifestyle and green space, and also um, to support the agenda that we have been running as an administration and will continue to run. Further speakers. Councillor Cup. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair. The Murphy saga. The Murphy saga. Thanks for coming. Um, oh no, sorry, keep going. <laughs> sorry. Take a moment to remind you we're doing A seriatim and yes, then B and C later. It. The Murphy saga is incorporated in A. Uh, <laughs> look, the processes of the Brisbane City Council are being treated with contempt by the Shrinner LNP administration. Uh, Councillor Murphy, at the ripe old age of, what is he, 30-odd, does not want to have to work to retain his ward. So he gets parachuted from Doughboy with a 4% margin to Chandler, which has a 24% margin at the last election. Now, I want to say that the in 2016, the uh, Labor candidate in uh, Chandler was a last-minute uni student candidate, and uh, the margin is exaggerated to start with. But anyhow, and, and of course, people in Carindale will recall having high-quality Labor representation in, in the not too distant past, with the likes of Terry McEnroth and Kevin Rudd, amongst others, as their as their members of Parliament. But uh, but anyhow, not only not only not only has Councillor Murphy run out on the electors of Doughboy. He's also focused on avoiding hard work altogether by resigning from Civic Cabinet. Now, with great fanfare, Councillor Schrinner had appointed Councillor Murphy, who's never shown any great interest in public or active transport, as he was appointed as chair to that committee. He chaired his first committee last week. Now, Councillor Murphy was part of a Civic Cabinet at last week's council meeting. He stuffed up in claiming Airport Link was built by the Brisbane City Council and passed over to the state government. In fact, the state government took on that project at the outset. Uh, the state government contractors built the Airport Link from day one. So he got that wrong, but I'm sure that I, 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 I hope that that wasn't a sacking offence, was it, Councillor, Councillor Schrinner? Everyone's entitled to a mistake. But anyhow. Uh, now, but now it's stated in the South East Advertise online yesterday that he will be standing down from Civic Cabinet, and I quote the article, in order to focus on Chandler Ward and to assist the new councillor for Doughboy to transition into that role. Uh, Mr Chair, how pathetic is that? Councillor Murphy claims he can't be in Civic Cabinet and uh, get around his new safe ward. This is Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, by the way, is known in Doughboy for not being doing negligible door knocking or any other hard yards campaigning or constituent activity. So what is Councillor Murphy's future? And uh, what's, what's his future? A cushy life as the council for Chandler. So, I mean, the only reason he, should have been par he would have been parachuted was because he's one of the supposed rising stars. And one of the rising stars should be cutting his teeth in uh, Civic Cabinet. No, no. He's making it the cushiest job. We, we want to know the real reason why Councillor Murphy got sacked, uh, Councillor Schwinner. Can you let us know? Can you let us know? Uh, why put Councillor Murphy in a safe ward if he was not to take on a civic cabinet role? What happened over the last week for the radical change of plan? Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on item A. Um, and I'd like to start by saying um, that I find the way that um, the Lord Mayor and the CEO have treated councillors with the production of this information before us today as truly appalling. Um, uh, at about 4.30 yesterday afternoon, we were sent um, the meeting papers for the special meeting. Uh, and there are essentially four paragraphs to it and then a recommendation. Uh, that basically says the following. The Chief Executive Officer provided the following information. That's paragraph one. Paragraph two. At the post-election meeting of Council on the 12th of April 2016, Council resolved to create a Council standing committees, including names and responsibilities. So that's a month ago we did that. Three. As a result of Councillor changes, consideration has been given to a review of the names, responsibilities 
and membership of some of the council standing committees as set out in attachment C submitted on file. Now, sounds pretty. Oh, sorry, then there's one more. And the chief executive officer provided the following recommendation, and it goes on with the recommendation. Um, at no point in this um, material before us today does it say we are electing a new finance chairperson, uh, that we are uh, electing a new uh, public and active transport and economic development chairperson. Um, we are provided with an attachment uh, that essentially says so everybody at home following along can play chair in brackets after the name. So um, here's my issue, Lord Mayor, seeing you're sitting there and you said you wanted to do things differently and you wanted to be consultative. Why drop this on us at the last minute? Uh, why, uh, why not make it clear in the council reports what you are intending to do? Um, the fact that you have to use a special provision in, in uh, the meeting's local law um, to undo what you did a month ago um, is an appalling indictment upon the governance and the transparency of the, uh, how this uh, city runs. Um, if you are going to make changes that are less than a month old from the changes you just made because you said we needed to make the changes, have the courtesy to tell councillors up front. Have the courtesy to be clear about what you are doing and why. Um, now, uh, what this does again uh, is a few things, and we've heard um, we've heard from uh, the Lord Mayor again today um, that um, this is about ongoing renewal. So I don't know what that means. Does it mean every week there's going to be a change? Is it like, oh, who's musical chairs this week? Who's going to be the chairman? Oh, is this one in? Is that one out? Um, is everybody going to get a go before the election next year? I mean, I, I don't know what that means. Um, it, it doesn't. It's not good for council officers to have a revolving door of chair people in charge. Um, it is not good for um, the residents of this city to have um, councillors being um, shopped about in different committees uh, to, uh, to take on these really substantive roles. And then to try and hide it, hide it in the council papers, um, like there's nothing to see here, I think, is a really poor reflection upon the way in which you have said that you want to govern, because that's not what I'm seeing in the information um, before us today. And I put my concerns on the record with the, um, uh, with the executive officer of council um, that this is one of the most appalling reports that I've ever seen. We are being asked to approve new committee chairman, and the report doesn't even mention uh, who they're going to be. And I would have thought that that's something you'd be proud of, not something you'd want to hide in an attachment with a little bracket around the outside um, for who it is. Now, let me be clear. Um, I've got absolutely no idea why the Lord Mayor thinks this weird line, the fact that um, this one, of the, well, one of the safest seats, because technically I have the safest seat, but one of the safest seats in Brisbane, uh, uh, Chandler Ward, his own ward, um, apparently the local councillor, the new local councillor about to be appointed there, doesn't have the capacity to be a chairman of council and be a local ward councillor with a 24.6 per cent margin, but the most marginal councillor in Brisbane, the councillor for Northgate, with a 1.7 per cent margin, does have the capacity to be a chairman of council uh, and uh, manage his ward. So, I mean, talk about stabbing poor Ryan Murphy in the back. I mean, it's only a month ago that uh, the Lord Mayor stood up here and was praising him from high heaven about how he was the future and he was wonderful and he was a smart young thing and he was going to bring renewal into Cabinet, all these wonderful things. Hang on. He's been in the job essentially a week and now he's out. Um, it, it doesn't add up. Now, I don't know um, Councillor Allen very well at all. Um, I note that he does, uh, you know, in principle, have some uh, qualifications in this area, but he's still fairly new uh, to council. I note that they've also had to butcher that portfolio, and it does not make sense. It does not make sense to separate out the economic development functions from the finance functions, because, as we've heard from the Lord Mayor, the only reason is, of course, Krista wants it. 
It's Krista's plaything. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Adams' plaything. Um, it's her passion project. Um, uh, meanwhile, let's see what the other passion projects she's had. She's been the deputy chairman of council, didn't do a good job. Deputy chairman of uh, planning, did a terrible job, thanks to that city plan we're all dealing with now. Uh, she's been the finance chairman. She was the lifestyle chairman. Um, now she's going to be the public and active uh, transport chairman. Every single portfolio that Councillor Adams has touched, she has botched. And now, simply to keep her happy, apparently we are moving the departments of council again, splitting what are complementary functions, how this uh, council runs its finances and the economic development of our city. We're chopping it in half so Krista can have her little plaything with. I'm sorry, Councillor Adams can have her yes, little yeah, plaything. Please, yep. please refer to Councillor Adams. Councillor Adams can have her little plaything at council. Well, that's just not on. This LNP administration today are simply showing us that they are focused on themselves, on what they can get out of it for themselves, because that's the only reason the Lord Mayor's given us um, this. Oh, Councillor Peter Maddock loves the arts, so he's getting the arts. Councillor Adams loves economic development, so she's getting economic development. I mean, it, this does not add up. Um, when the Lord Mayor was sworn in um, you know, back in April, he said that he wanted to focus on the future of Brisbane. All I can see is an LNP administration that is focusing on themselves. On themselves. Um, there's still, despite the fact that again committees are changing another week after the last changes, there's still no consultation with the opposition councillors. Um, there's still no attempt to address the issues that they have raised uh, in this place, uh, to include them in the discussion about how this city functions. And meanwhile, meanwhile, the only explanations we are being given do not add up. If the councillor sitting in one of the safest seats in Brisbane doesn't have the capacity to be a chairman, why on earth is a councillor in a marginal seat um, being asked to take on that responsibility? So that, that just doesn't add up. It does not wash. Um, councillor Ryan Murphy has been dumped for some reason that is not public yet. My best guess might be it's to do with the boundary redistribution, and I'll be waiting to see the LNP's uh, submission uh, for the local government uh, boundary changes. Let's just see whether this has all suddenly happened, because Councillor Murphy stood down on the 13th of May, uh, or the, the 11th, only a couple of days ago. This has all been done super quick. There is some other reason at play here. It is poor form by the Lord Mayor to do this um, and to make these changes and then to stand up and say somehow um, his administration is focused about the city when all they are doing yet again is focusing on themselves, what they as individuals can get out of it, as we've heard today, um, and just making sure that the way in which this city runs is done um, because they like it that way. That's essentially what we've heard today. I mean, Councillor Adams has not done a brilliant job running the finances of this city. Um, debt's out of control. Projects aren't being managed on time and on budget. Um, there is a statutory commitment to run a balanced budget. So when she says, I've balanced the budget, that's because it is a statutory requirement to do so. Um, but the way in which the financial circumstances of this council have been handled in the last few years has not been done well. I don't know how much of that Councillor Allen has been involved in as the Deputy Finance Chairman. Um, Councillor Johnson, your time has expired. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. And talk about Take Out the Trash Week. Uh, we have here, uh, uh, writ large, the LNP's real intentions when it comes to uh, their tired old administration, and that is to continually gaze at their navel. Uh, it is to play factional games within their party room, uh, to shuffle around uh, the players in the LNP uh, for their own enjoyment. For their own enjoyment. It's clear that they're treating this place, they're treating the administration of the City of Brisbane, they're treating the Chamber and uh, our committee system with utter contempt. Um, 
Reading the Courier Mail today, Gleeso's column, he talks about uh, the loss of faith in local government here in Queensland. And this is another great reason why people, not just voters out there, look at how this LNP runs this, this organisation uh, and their administration in council, but how the nearly 10,000 employees of the city of Brisbane would look at this administration and shake their heads. Those hardworking council employees, whether they're in our asset services teams, parks teams, in libraries, in the contact centre, our bus drivers at our, or workers at our depots, they have to grin and bear when these LNP councillors come out there and grandstand and, and uh, with their Cheshire cat grins when they go into those workplaces. Uh, and they know that those LNP councillors go into their civic cabinet and uh, vote to uh, make sure that they can give uh, them the worst possible uh, enterprise agreements, uh, and they know Councilor they Councilor know. Cassidy, can I just bring you back to the item, please? I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you to talk generally, but EBAs aren't in the, in the item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and those council employees know when they see uh, these shenanigans that happen in the LNP party room, determining who's going to get the prizes, who's going to get the extra money in the nicer car this week. You know, Ryan Murphy, Mr Murphy now, he's not even a councillor anymore, got the nice car and the big pay packet last week. Councillor Allen's getting it this week. Who's going to get it next week? I mean, this is, this is the shambles. There was more stability on the chairs on the Titanic than there are in this administration now, Mr Chair. Uh, it is absolutely extraordinary what is happening uh, in uh, terms of administration in this city. And this administration is taking the committee system uh, for granted uh, and they're treating it with utter contempt. Uh, what is really clear and really evident now is that the only stability uh, in our committee system uh, in council are Labor councillors. You know, Labor councillors are the only ones that are actually making a meaningful contribution to our committees now because so many of these committees are getting a new chair every week, a new deputy chair every week, um, whole new compositions every week. As we see LNP councillors marching out, we know Councillor Wyndham's going in June uh, because Tracy Davis, his replacement, has been shopping that around to community groups. She said the date that he's going. Uh, there's some news. Uh, there's a new councillor in. No, he's saying he's not going in June. He might be staying longer. He might be staying longer. <laughs> Oh, well, he's not going tonight anyway, we know that. Uh, we've got new councillors in Walter Taylor and Cooparoo, uh, and a new councillor soon in Doboy, new councillor uh, in Chandler Ward. Uh, you tried to leave us, uh, uh, Mr Chair, not so long ago. Councillor Owen is uh, trying to leave us now. Uh, it's clear that after 16 long years in administration, uh, the LNP are treating this council like a plaything. When it comes to those uh, council employees that uh, work incredibly hard, uh, you know, they, they would just be shaking their heads when they see how this uh, LNP administration uh, plays around with the, the jobs and the departments and the portfolios uh, and switching around responsibilities between chairs just because they like it, just because it's their little pet projects of theirs. Uh, you, would, you would have thought you know, the Public uh, and Active Transport Committee, very important committee, uh, tackling very important things, is now on to its um, third chair. You would have hoped that when uh, you know, Councillor Murphy, as he was then known, uh, took over the reins of that, uh, and you know, he said, uh, you know, he was quoted just a month ago, that he couldn't wait to get started on those big issues, could not wait to sink his teeth into that portfolio. Uh, he said he's been in tough fights before. Uh, he said it's always difficult balancing responsibilities as a ward councillor now coming into civic cabinet, but you know, it would take time away, but he'll just have to redouble his efforts. We, knew, we now know what he means re redoubling his efforts. That was <laughs> out there seeking pre-selection in the safest LNP ward in Brisbane. You would have hoped, and I'm sure those thousands of bus drivers out there in Brisbane would have hoped that Councillor Murphy, when he got into the public transport uh, chair role, he would have gone into civic cabinet, thumping the table, saying, I demand better protection for our bus drivers, but all he went in there demanding was a better ward. That's all he cared about. And that's what we've come to expect from this LNP administration. We've got bus drivers out there who are having lighters waved in their faces. They're having liquids thrown over them. They're being punched in the face. And we've got an administration that is week in, week out, shuffling public transport chairs. This is disgraceful. This is disgraceful behaviour by this administration. They're clearly more interested in their own jobs 
than the jobs of our council employees in providing the services to the residents of the city of Brisbane. Uh, you have been caught out for what you people are, and March 2020 cannot come soon enough. Further speakers, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I rise to speak on um, um, item A. Uh, the, uh, the responsibilities and uh, membership of the standing committees. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I'm experiencing a bit of deja vu with this report. Uh, didn't we just spend two hours at the last meeting debating who is on the committees? And we're back here again. Um, if we have a look at uh, what has happened on the committees and the chairs since the resignation of uh, uh, Lord Mayor Graham Quirk on the 8th of April, it more resembles a low rent chain um, Game of Thrones. My apologies to the Game of Thrones. Terrific show. Um, we had uh, the Lord Mayor resigned, um, handing the baton on to uh, Councillor Schrinner. Uh, then he walked away from public active transport, um, um, which uh, then he uh, handed that on to uh, Councillor Murphy, uh, who was installed. And, um, and that, with some great fanfare, as uh, one of my colleagues has said, uh, that, uh, that lasted a week until the resignation of the councillor uh, from Doughboy, uh, along with the uh, public active uh, transport uh, portfolio. Councillor Adams, our new deputy mayor, uh, has stepped down from the uh, chair of finance and economic development with her vice chair taking up the uh, finance chair without the economic development portfolio. Looks like Councillor Allen couldn't be trusted. So we have Councillor Adams as the deputy mayor and also in a super portfolio of public active transport and economic development. This is on top of other resignations from uh, former Councillor uh, uh, Julian Simmons, uh, Ian McKenzie, and of course, we know of the retirement, the imminent retirement of Councillor Wyndham, that all held chairs uh, on these uh, on these committee, or all held positions on these committees. So let's look at the full card. And if I get some of it wrong, I'm sorry because there's been so much; it's really hard to keep track. One Lord Mayor resigning, that included, of course, his uh, job as ENC committee chair. One Lord Mayor uh, and ENC chair appointed, unelected. Five councillors' resignations or imminent resignations. Uh, four new councillors appointed, not elected. Five new chairs and counting. And then I lost count of all the uh, changes on the committees, uh, the individual committees, yeah. Mr. Chair, I think uh, it is more an LMP, it's more LMP chaos as if we have witnessed in the state and federal politics. This administration has little regard for the ward for, for the hardworking ratepayers of Brisbane and, uh, and the way they treat their wards and their committee positions. I say roll on. No, I'll back that up. I'll have a little bit more to say about that. If this is a smooth transition that the Lord may have purported, I'd hate to see a bumpy one. So in conclusion, I say roll on March 2020 when Brisbane voters will have their say and hopefully change the channel on this poor performing LMP reality show. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, the further speakers, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak briefly on item A, the alteration of the committees. Mr. Chair, here we are again, another week, and as we have heard, another shuffling of the deck chairs for the LMP. Mr. Chair, the LMP are in complete disarray in this place. We heard the new Lord Mayor talk this afternoon about chaos, and so he should. He is well versed in chaos, what is happening on the other side of the chamber every single week since he was parachuted into the role is chaos. The disarray and chaos is clear when questions are asked of the LNP chair people in this place and they can't answer. We saw this with Councillor Hammond last week and again today with the Lord Mayor extraordinarily having to intervene to cover up the inexperience and lack of qualifications on that side of the chamber. The Lord Mayor preaches to the opposition today about his highly qualified, experienced team, and they can't even answer basic questions 
about their own signature policy commitments like the zip line. Mr Chair, the disarray and chaos is clear in the agendas presented in this place, which are now consumed by LNP resignations and replacements. Mr Chair, these replacements are not democratically elected by the people of this city, yeah, yeah. but by the same arrogant and out-of-touch LNP that have made this place, as Councillor Johnston and Councillor Cassidy have said, their plaything. Finally, Mr Chair, the disarray and chaos is clear in the committee room, where instead of looking to the future, they get by with rehashing past projects with a new chairperson everywhere you look. This LNP administration is willing to do whatever it takes to maintain their massive majority. They don't care what the people of Brisbane think or want. They don't care about actually running this city. They only care about themselves, self-preservation and self-promotion. They are so consumed by retaining their seats that they have forgotten why we are here. Let me remind you, we are here to serve. We are here to serve our communities. Now, Mr Chair, I am one of the Labor councillors who has been directly impacted by the LNP's need to cling to power in this place. I have been removed without consent by the pub from the Public and Active Transport Committee last week. Um, I'm not going to stand here and relitigate the appalling conduct of the new Lord Mayor in misleading the Leader of the Opposition about his intentions when it came to committees. I'm not going to speculate on any backroom deals that have been done within the LNP party room or with the Greens or with our independent councillor in this place who have miraculously also landed on their preferred committees. I don't need to, Mr Chair, because here we are again debating new committee membership and now also new committee names and responsibilities. And Mr Chair, I can guarantee we will be here again next week, maybe the week after, to have these debates all over again. And who knows? I, I'd like to spec speculate maybe the reappointment of Councillor Murphy to a chair role. Anything is possible in this place. This conduct by the LNP Lord Mayor and LNP administration is shameful. They need to get on with the job of running this city, not navel-gazing. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks. I'll <clears throat> try to keep it brief. Um, I feel a bit torn on this motion because, on, on the one hand, I, I don't think it's a particularly good practice to be changing chairs and key leadership roles um, in such a short space of time. Um, and I, I'm sure there are complex circumstances behind the scenes that we're not all privy to, but it's, it's really frustrating for me as a councillor when you spend that time building relationships, discussing priorities, only to have um, things change so quickly. Um, on the other hand, I, I'm kind of inclined to support the motion because if someone doesn't want to be the chair of a particular committee, I don't think we should be forcing them to do so. And if Councillor Murphy is, um, or former Councillor Murphy has decided that he doesn't want to chair that committee right now, I think logically we probably should, have, should support replacing him. Um, so I'll probably be abstaining on, on that basis from the motion. But um, given that this looks like a a fait accompli, I might just welcome, as one of the longest serving members of the Public and Active Transport Committee, I might take the liberty of <laughs> welcoming Councillor Adams to the chair of that portfolio um, and to, to use this opportunity just to highlight some, some of the important steps I hope you'll take in that significant role. Um, I, through you, Mr Chair, I encourage Councillor Adams to remember that um, all of the councillors on that committee are genuinely committed to improving public and active transport. Um, and that while there's sometimes a temptation to um, engage in adversarialism and um, divisive party politics, it, it would be good to find those opportunities to work together constructively as, as often as possible. And I would certainly appreciate the opportunity to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, Councillor Adams, in the near future to discuss the priorities for my ward and some of the citywide opportunities. Um, I know that planning transport across the city is difficult, not least because there are different um, values and priorities among different constituencies around the city. But I want to re-emphasise that in terms of my ward at least, there is very, very strong support for um, deprioritising cars and, and allowing greater space and greater emphasis for public transport and active transport. 
And I hope that through you, Mr. Chair, as the chair of that committee, Councillor Adams will um, be mindful of the fact that um, what might make sense for residents in outer suburban areas doesn't necessarily align with the values of residents in some of those inner city suburbs where there is, there is a much stronger support, in particular for improving pedestrian convenience and pedestrian safety, but also cycling safety and public transport frequencies. Um, one of my highest priorities as a councillor um, One of my highest priorities as a council that I hope Councillor Adams will take seriously is the um, importance of bus priority lanes on a lot of those key arterials. It is now um, well past time that we started converting lanes of general traffic in inner city areas towards dedicated bus lanes. There are some routes where it makes sense that rather than dedicated bus lanes, we use T3 lanes. And I hope that Councillor Adams, in her role as chair of this committee, will be really mindful of that important change. This is something that the committee needs to be taking seriously. It's low-hanging fruit. It doesn't cost the council a lot, but it makes a big difference to public transport. In terms of the governance of the committee more generally, I hope Councillor Adams will be um, open to other councillors suggesting and recommending topics for committee presentations and, and will be transparent in terms of providing information in a timely manner. It's really difficult to make informed decisions when we don't receive briefings about big changes or when we request data on um, for example, bus patronage figures, and it takes a long time to hear back. So um, in the spirit of working collaboratively, I hope Councillor Adams will instruct her officers that um, they, they can and should speak freely with other councillors and share information when it's requested so that we can all make um, positive and constructive decisions in the best interest of the city. Welcome to the new role. Further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd just like to stand to congratulate, speak on item A and congratulate Councillor Adam Allen on his elevation to Cabinet. Um, he has been a spectacular Deputy um, Chair within the Finance and Administration role. Um, obviously, as the Lord Mayor mentioned before, very experienced within um, a private industry uh, here and overseas. And his uh, background brings a wealth of knowledge and, as I said, has been a great support over the last couple of years. He's been heavily involved in that um, economic review process in those years, including this budget, which has been a very long process to date, with only a few more weeks to go. Um, we're very happy to have him in Cabinet, and congratulations to him, and he will do a stellar job in delivering, I am sure, an outstanding budget with Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. Further speakers? Councillor Maddox. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I just rise to speak in regards to item A and the name change of our committee. Um, to Community Arts and Lifestyle from its current Lifestyle and Community Services Committee. Um, and I, I, I thank um, my colleagues uh, for the consideration of the change. I think it's important uh, within this portfolio to understand the enormous contribution that Council makes towards the arts, particularly in the areas of emerging artists uh, across our city. Um, and I thought it was important within this portfolio to give that recognition uh, to that investment, uh, not only of the passion and commitment of this administration uh, and the officers, uh, but importantly, the uh, financial investment that we also provide as well. When you look at the breadth of this portfolio, and it, it covers many, many different areas of, around essential services, such as libraries and the call centre and pools and uh, all of the different festivals and events, but the arts is fundamentally one of the most important things that we do as well. I think as a city and as we grow, um, our contribution to the arts is more than just a form of entertainment. Our contribution to the arts is also about the character and the nature of our city. And as we continue to grow as a city, what the arts means to us is defining as to who we are as people. Uh, when you look at cities around the world, the investment and, the, um, and the, the spotlight on the arts is fundamental to the experience that people have there. And when you look at, uh, and when you look at the city collectively, uh, the arts is in large part a reflection of the vitality and the character of that city. And you know, Melbourne is a perfect example, um, not only nationally but internationally, for, for its contribution to the arts and what it is known as a cultural city. And I think as Brisbane, we have so many amazingly talented artists, not only established but emerging as well, uh, that need to have recognition and support for what they do. And this council goes a long way to providing that grassroots support, uh, whether it be in kind, whether it be in acknowledgement, whether it be through grants programs, 
or whether it be through direct funding, through partnerships, uh, that go such a long way towards uh, allowing those people the opportunity to not only live their passion, but continue to do so as well. So when you look at the arts within our society, it is not just an expression of who we are, but it is fundamentally our, our soul as human beings. And that we as a society can only grow when we continue to grow our soul creatively. And being able to do that is fundamental, not only to our nature, but also to our community. We as a society and as a community are very diverse in our culture and understanding. And the arts fundamentally binds us together as a multicultural society. And being able to provide the necessary funding and support to that is absolutely core to what this city is about. Importantly also, our work in the Indigenous area, and I, I have to really take my hat off to the officers in the support of grassroots Indigenous arts and expression uh, in, in our community is absolutely fundamental. And when I talk about the, the investment in the arts, uh, we have to talk about the important uh, work that we do for, in support of our First Nations people and making sure that uh, their culture, their stories are, are expressed, but also held within our community, that we can all grow and learn from the experiences and the knowledge of our First Nations people. And that's why our committee and the work that we do is so fundamental to uh, our city as a whole, and importantly, the contribution that this administration makes. So um, it's a, the, 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 the name change in itself is simple, but I think quite fundamental in acknowledging the contribution of all the officers, this organisation and this administration. And I, I certainly ask the chamber to support this change uh, so that we can give the arts its proper recognition and this council as well. Thank you. Further speakers? Right reply, Lord Mayor. Uh, just uh, briefly, uh, Mr Chair. Um, Labor seems to be in this bubble where they believe if they all repeat the same thing again and again that it might come true. Um, the reality is what's happened here is really clear. We've had um, a resignation from Cabinet and we've got to fill that position. What do you expect us to do? You want to leave us vacant? You want me to leave the position vacant? If there's a resignation from Cabinet, you've got to fill that position. Uh, and as I've pointed out many times before, we've got this great talented team and plenty of people that can step up and do the roles. Um, so, uh, and, you know, that's what's happening here. Um, so, yes, we're getting on with the job. We're uh, filling that position in Cabinet. We're moving on, focused 100 per cent on the future of the city, on what the residents of Brisbane want us to be focused on, which is building uh, the infrastructure our city needs for the future, protecting our green space and our lifestyle, uh, and getting on with making sure that the Brisbane of tomorrow is better than the Brisbane of today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. All right, I'm going to put item A of this Establishment and Coordination Committee. Those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Councillor Cumming and Councillor Strunk. Ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells.
Attendance, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 15 in favour, five against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Councillors should recall that we took item A, sorry, item for debate and vote, and therefore we will now continue the ENC special on items B and C. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, items B and C uh, relate to the appointment of, uh, Councillor, well, of Fiona Cunningham as the new councillor for Cooper Ward uh, and Ryan Murphy as the new councillor for Chandler Ward. Now, um, the uh, appointments that we're seeing today will make sure that uh, those local communities in Chandler and in Cooparoo get absolutely effective and passionate representatives who, are, uh, who know their area, uh, who are committed to their area and will work uh, flat out and put their heart into it. Um, and I'm particularly excited uh, to see um, uh, Fiona being appointed as the councillor for Cooper Ward. Uh, Fiona is a lifelong resident of Brisbane and currently lives in Greenslopes with her husband Dane and son Charlie. Uh, she is an active member of her local community, being part of Rotary in her area. Uh, she uh, grew up and completed high school on the south side, was educated at Griffith University uh, and has worked in various roles, uh, including radio, radio journalist, um, in both the public and private sectors, and also in ex external relations and marketing. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to welcome Fiona uh, to the team. Um, interestingly, over the, over the years, as ward boundaries change, um, I know uh, that uh, my former ward of Chandler uh, used to include a big part of Cooparoo Ward, and particularly uh, parts of Carina Heights and Camp Hill, and also the locality of Whites Hill. Uh, I know Fiona will do a fantastic job uh, representing those residents and also uh, in other parts of Cooparoo as well. Um, I, I was so excited that uh, the LNP put her nomination forward um, and uh, look forward to working with her um, in the team going forward and, and once again seeing this renewal occurring uh, following uh, Councillor Mackenzie's retirement. Um, and obviously we heard last, last week uh, his final speech and we all wish him the best going forward in the future. Uh, in relation to Chandler Ward, uh, once again, over the, over the years there has been uh, changes in ward boundaries and in particular at the last election, we saw um, a significant chunk of Doughboy Ward come into Chandler Ward. Um, suburbs uh, such as uh, Ransom and also a, a significant part of Wakeley uh, came into Chandler Ward, uh, people that were previously in the Doughboy Ward moving across. Uh, we also share uh, the suburb of Belmont as well, between uh, Doughboy and Chandler Ward. And interestingly, uh, Ryan Murphy uh, grew up and lived for most of his life in the Chandler Ward. Uh, he went to school at Carina State School uh, in the Chandler Ward. Uh, his family lives to this day uh, in the Chandler Ward. Uh, he is as local as local can be in the Chandler Ward. And um, I heard some comments before about uh, Councillor Murphy, um, uh, you know, and the comments that the Labor Party made are just out of touch with reality. Uh, this is a, a, Ryan Murphy was a councillor that went into a Labor held ward that was held by the Labor Party for 30 years and beat and beat a 30-year veteran, John Campbell. Uh, and he did that by representing his residents well, by slogging his guts out for his community. Uh, and he did that again in 2016 uh, when he was up against it, uh, when the Labor Party uh, pulled out all stops to try and beat him in Doughboy. Uh, and and this, is, this is a person that passionately represents uh, their community. And I've got to say, uh, the community he represents 
uh, will be his local community. I know that the boundary between the Chandler Ward uh, and the Doughboy Ward might be Meadowlands Road, but that's not where the community stops. Uh, the community goes across that whole part of Brisbane in the eastern suburbs. Uh, and so this is not a case of, for example, um, you know, say uh, Cameron Dick moving from Green Slopes to Woodridge. That's, right. that's not a case of that. Um, that's not a case of Stephen Miles moving from Mount Cutha to Marumba. This is not, this is not even the same thing. Not even the same thing. This is the same community in the eastern suburbs of Brisbane where Ryan Murphy grew up, uh, where uh, he is passionate about. Um, and I've got to say, as, as an ongoing resident of Chandler Ward, I think it's fantastic uh, that Ryan will be my new councillor. I know that he will work hard representing all residents of Chandler Ward. Um, and I'll certainly be um, you know, lodging any complaints with his office if I, if I see any problems, but no, I'm sure he will get onto it proactively. So um, what we're seeing today is two uh, highly effective, proactive, talented people uh, in Cooparoo Ward and Chandler Ward, uh, and I think it'll be a fantastic outcome for the residents of those areas. Further speakers, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, in relation to item B, uh, we welcome Councillor Cunningham to Cooper Award, but her, hope her stay will be a short one. Uh, as I said last week, when wishing Councillor Mackenzie all of Essendon's retirement, the sooner Labor's Matthew Campbell becomes a Councillor of Cooper Roo, the better. Uh, in relation to item C, look, I can't recall anyone being parachuted from one ward to another to, to boost their vote in my 25 years in Council. Uh, I can recall uh, we had some fierce battles in the Labor Party in the, before the 1994 election when I got elected, uh, be, but it was, it, was, uh, it was between sitting councillors and other members of the party, or in one case two sitting councillors running against each other for the same ward, uh, and, uh, but never uh, someone moving from, uh, from one ward to another to uh, boost their vote. And of course, uh, the, the fear in the back of the mind of Councillor Murphy and the Lord Mayor is, of course, that there's a redistribution underway and that uh, uh, the fear is that more of Wakerley might go from, uh, uh, from Doughboy into, uh, into Chandler and make uh, Doughboy increasingly difficult. And as, as the Lord Mayor said, look, uh, uh, Councillor Murphy, he's probably had to campaign pretty hard to win on a couple of occasions, and obviously that's not for him anymore. He, he's not interested in campaigning hard in, in uh, a marginal war anymore. He wants a safe ward, so there you go. If you decide to give it to him, right here. Anyhow, um, and, but I would hope that his decision results and his legacy will be that the LNP lose Doughboy Ward and that Joe Culshaw is the next elected councillor for Doughboy Ward. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on item uh, B and C. Um, firstly, with respect to item B, uh, I uh, note the um, Liberal Party's decision to appoint uh, Fiona Cunningham as the new councillor uh, for Cooparoo Ward. Uh, Cooparoo Ward shares a boundary with Tennyson Ward uh, through Annerley. And it, it's always been very disappointing that Councillor Mackenzie uh, did not take an interest in the really important road safety issues uh, through that Ipswich Road corridor um, that I've been advocating for for many years in this place. Um, so I hope that uh, Fiona Cunningham will take a greater interest in the need to look at road safety improvements uh, through that area. And you know, if I had a crystal ball, if I had a crystal ball. I think, well, maybe we might see them, the Liberals all standing out there claiming credit for you know, all the hard work on Ipswich Road that they've done, and we'll see what happens uh, come uh, closer to the election. Um, but uh, fear, yeah. Um, but I, I th look, I think it's, it's fair to say that um, we need a councillor in Cooper Roo Ward that is interested in doing what is necessary to support the Annerley community. And whilst Councillor Mackenzie certainly provided money for the school, which um, is great, um, and I continued to provide money for Junction Park State School as well, he showed no interest in any way, shape or form um, about supporting uh, the road safety issues, uh, the skip that I've been calling for for the 11 years I've been here, which is now a village precinct project. Councillor Cooper's explanation as planning chairperson, would, it's too expensive. 
It's too expensive, you know. That's why we can't upgrade a neighbourhood shopping precinct because it's too expensive. Meanwhile, she's getting a five million dollar yeah. project. Councillor Johnson, we're pretty generous around here, but can you just just keep it a little bit more relevant to the report, please? Pardon? Could you just keep it just a little bit more relevant? Could you just keep it just a little more relevant Talking. than, than this, 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 yeah. the cost of skips for me? Yeah. Yes, Councillor uh, Cunningham, Cooper Ward shares a boundary with Tennyson Ward, Annerley, part of both our wards. I would like to work with her on these issues, and I'm outlining what the important issues are for Cooper Reward. I think that's reasonably relevant to the issue. And I'm just saying that I note Councillor Cooper's managed to fund a major project in her ward, and I would hope that she can find some funding to support Cooper Reward and Tennyson Ward going uh, forward. Um, uh, the Annerley Community Bookshop remains an unresolved issue at this point as well, uh, and there are a number of other things that need doing uh, you know, through Annerley, but particularly the road safety issues are a top priority. Um, the files that I've seen, which I've been told by the CEO under threat that if I reveal them I'll be in trouble, but the files that I've seen, yeah, 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 I'm not allowed to talk about what's in the files, but the files that I've seen just look appalling. And, um, you know, Councillor Cooper, I can just flag with you now that I don't believe you've done anything that I can see in the files um, that you have said that you will do. Uh, and I have extreme Sorry. concern uh, Councillor about Johnson, that. as I said, we, we, you can be very broad, but this is just a bit too broad. Hey? Can we just try and yep. stick to the topic yep. again, please? Yep. I, I, I understand and I note that the councillor for Cooper Reward um, it's too broad for her to consider the serious issues in Annerley that will be in her ward. So thank you for drawing my attention to that. Uh, look, finally, just on uh, item C, uh, Councillor Murphy. I mean, we knew about this weeks ago, um, weeks ago that he was going to run uh, for uh, this seat, that he, it, the 4% the margin in Doughboy was looking a bit scary, and uh, he was going to jump over to, to Chandler Ward with its 24.4% margin. So, I mean, if we knew about it, the media knew about it, everybody in Blind Freddy knew about it, how is it that when he was appointing his cabinet, he didn't know um, back you know, a few weeks ago? Of course he knew. Of course he knew. Um, the, the idea that Councillor Murphy is doing this for any reason other than self-preservation is just appalling. Um, we've even heard the Lord Mayor stand up here today and say he's passionate about his community. He's passionately represented his community. Yeah, past tense. He's so passionate about representing his community, he's abandoning them 10 months before the election to move over to the adjacent safe seat. Now, that's not what you do. Um, good local members stay and fight in their areas. They help their party, they help their community, um, and they do the right thing. Councillor Murphy, at the first opportunity, has gone, yeah, I'll take that promotion. Uh, no worries about that, and I'll, I'll take the extra money in the car and all the things that come with that. And then he's gone, oh, and I'm going to take the safe seat as well. I'd love to know how the discussion went behind closed doors as to you've got to go or, yeah, I'm going to voluntarily go. That would have been a good one, I reckon. Um, but what this shows us again today is that this administration is only focused on themselves, yes. what they can get out of the city of Brisbane, yeah. not what they can give to the city of Brisbane. Yeah. Um, because now um, the musical chairs that have been going on here for weeks are going to continue. Doughboy has to find a new councillor. And goodness me, goodness me, haven't the Liberals set that poor person up for a bit of a hiding? Yes. I mean, uh, you know, they're going to put someone in there and then they're going to send out the councillor for Chandler Ward who abandoned them to try and help them win it? I really don't think residents are that silly. They know, they know residents in this city are smart and they know when they are being treated like fools um, by this LNP administration. Now, as I said earlier, I suspect there's something else behind all of this. Um, and I suspect it might be something to do with the redistribution, but we will we will wait and see. Um, because I just think that Councillor Murphy's um, decision was not something unknown to this Lord Mayor. And yet, um, instead of making these changes, you know, even last week when he could have with more minimal disruption, he didn't. 
I mean, he knew all this was coming down the track. I mean, for God's sake, I heard the only other candidate was a friend of Angela's, so I didn't think that was going to go anywhere. I mean, I don't know what was going on. But um, it's just not OK to treat um, the serious statutory appointments in this place as a plaything of the LNP. You're not here to get out of it what you want. You are here to support the residents of our city. And the last few weeks have shown that your focus is completely the wrong way around. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, just briefly on item C, I, I don't think uh, the Lord Mayor has adequately explained no. to the people, to, to the Chamber uh, and to the people of the Doughboy Ward and uh, the Chandler Ward um, what has gone on here. Um, I think uh, tonight he's sort of given a partial explanation that um, uh, Ryan ran in Doughboy um, just as a bit of a political exercise, because his explanation tonight is that Ryan's connections to the community um, have always been Chandler. He's never really liked Doughboy. Uh, you know, he, he under sort of under duress, he represented the people of Doughboy because the LNP sort of asked him to, and you know, he put in the hard yard, so uh, they gave him a, a few positions, and then they made him a chair. Uh, and as soon as that opportunity came up. Uh, he jumped for it. He took the life raft uh, and he jumped ship and went over to the Chandler Ward. But, I mean, was there, was there, was there some arrangement? Was there some arrangement between uh, Councillor Schrinner and Ryan uh, that this was always going to happen? And have we just unnecessarily, at every single meeting since the special meeting uh, in April, to appoint Councillor Schrinner, gone through these committee changes and wasted all this time in the chamber instead of actually going out there and uh, governing in this city? It's absolutely extraordinary now that, that the Lord Mayor is trying to somehow rewrite uh, what has happened. The reality of what has happened is that Ryan has um, taken a life jacket uh, and jumped ship into a safe uh, LMP ward. And I think Councillor Johnston's right. There's going to be a new LMP councillor in Doughboy Ward. They're going to go around and, and all those people, those residents that uh, uh, Ryan worked hard to uh, win, their, win the trust of will say, what happened to him? Where did he go? And they'll say, no, no, he didn't. He didn't care about you at all. He never cared about you. All he cared about was Chandler Ward. Yeah, all he cared about was Chandler Ward. All his families from Chandler Ward, all the community groups that he's really only ever cared about were in Chandler Ward. I don't think he's actually going to say that. Um, he might have to lie to them. He might have to lie to them. Maybe he will. Maybe he will, Councillor Johnston, because there's going to be there's going to be a lot of explaining to do out in that community, uh, you know. And uh, uh, I, I just say to the to the people of Doughboy and the electors of Doughboy, you have a, a very clear choice now when it comes uh, to the next election. Uh, there is a great Labor candidate, Joe Colshaw, out there uh, uh, running in uh, Doughboy. Uh, in, a, t a resident of 20 years, someone who actually is involved in that community and cares very deeply about that community, uh, rather than uh, a councillor who will be sitting in the 24 per cent margin seat next door, helping out uh, in his old ward because there's you know, just a road that separates them and somehow that makes it all OK. Uh, I think uh, people will realise uh, what this is all about, uh, and it's all about politics for the LNP. Excuse me, further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I stand to rise on item B and C. And uh, as uh, Holland Park local councillor, I'm very excited to welcome uh, soon-to-be Councillor Cunningham into the role of the chair, uh, chair as the uh, councillor for Cooparoo, and also for Ryan Murphy to be uh, councillor for Chandler, because both of these wards um, uh, the boundaries for the Holland Park Ward, and I'm looking forward to working with them closely. Um, there are parts of Marikabad East within Chandler, uh, in Holland Park that used to be in Chandler, and vice versa, obviously, with Cooparoo and Holland Park. Uh, both of them are locals in those areas that they are going to be representing, and I'm very excited with uh, Fiona as a mum of a young child who's grown up in the area, um, showing her around in particular to where she. Uh, we've got some bordering schools, etc., to make sure that uh, she gets to meet all the people 
and there will be absolutely no doubt the more people that she meets as she is in this role that we all have Councillor Cunningham for many years to come in the Cooper Reward. And uh, when Councillor Murphy returns to the chamber, I look forward as a uh, bordering councillor to be working with him as well in conjunction with our uh, very uh, similar areas within the Malkovat and uh, East and Mansfield areas as well. So I support both of these items on the papers today. For the speakers, Councillor Maddox. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And I rise uh, to uh, speak in regards to item B in the appointment of Fiona Cunningham as Councillor for the Cooper Award. And I do so with a great amount of pleasure knowing Fiona for a number of years. I was pleased to see the appointment uh, by the LNP of Fiona for that role. She will bring, uh, Mr Chair, so much enthusiasm and energy to the role um, that I think uh, it will be something that uh, will be well embraced by her community. Um, Fiona is a passionate local resident, uh, a strong believer in her community, and I know that she will be working day in, day out to represent the interests of her community and putting her ward uh, first and foremost at, at her, her mind. Um, she is strongly supported by her husband, Dane, uh, in this role. As all councillors know in this chamber, uh, it is a challenging job um, and we cannot do it with the support of uh, our partners. And he himself uh, passionately supports her in this role to make sure that she does the best for her ward. She brings, uh, Mr Chair, uh, to this role uh, the essential element of what uh, service is about, and that is what this role is always first and foremost about, serving our community, putting our community forwards, and making sure that we deliver outcomes for the betterment of our, of our local community. Uh, there is no doubt whatsoever that uh, she has hit the ground running in getting out and about and uh, working with local community organisations, uh, getting a feel of what those groups are about and what their priorities are. Uh, and Once uh, she is formally appointed into this role, I know that she's uh, absolutely going to throw herself into it, uh, attending all of the necessary meetings, working with community, consulting on various issues and making sure uh, that she becomes a strong voice for her community in this, in this, not only in this chamber but in the council. That's the kind of uh, energy enthusiasm, uh, Mr Chair, that uh, the councillors on this side of the chamber bring. And as the Lord Mayor clearly said, this is about a refresh, this is about a renewal, making sure that we continue to deliver for our local residents. And that's what uh, Fiona will do. That's what's so important about this appointment today. That's what this administration represents. It presents a new face, a new future, a new energy as well. And making sure that we continue to deliver first and foremost for our residents. The op those opposite, uh, Mr Chair, uh, like as Councillor Cummings, and I'll try to do my best, Councillor Cummings. <laughs> After 20 odd years in this chamber, he cannot even open his mouth anymore properly to speak. And I'm Point not of sure order, Mr. Chair. Councillor Shree, I didn't hear that. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Um, just seeking that, um, that you in ensure that there's respectful debate in the chamber. And ensure, I, I think perhaps impressions are a little bit too far. I can do lots of impressions of councillors as well, uh, but I don't think we no, want to go you, down that you, road. Councillor Shree. Absolutely. Courtesy is paramount in this place. Thank you. Um, Absolutely Mayor. it is, Mr Chair. And I only do it in jest. I know Councillor Cummings well. He is a, a good-hearted person. I choose to ignore the comments of those councillors opposite that so spoke so disparagingly of councillors opposite. In fact, I heard Councillor Cummings say uh, that the sooner the ALP councillor is appointed, the better. But we shall put those personal comments aside, Mr Chair. I am not a person that takes those on board. I simply do it in jest of Councillor Cummings. If he was in the chamber, I'm sure he would be laughing as well if he was in the chamber, Mr Chair, but he obviously is not, but for whatever reason. What we really want to focus on here is the appointment of uh, Councillor Cunningham to this uh, key role to her ward, and I and all councillors on this chamber, uh, this side of the chamber, look forward to working with her uh, and em embracing her ideas, her vision and, and, and her representations of her local residents to make sure that she continues to deliver in the fine tradition of this side of the chamber for the benefit of all residents of Cooper Ward, as we have in the past, as Councillor Cunningham will do now, and importantly in March 2020, Mr Chair, as Councillor Cunningham will do in the future. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor, by reply. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, once again, it's been interesting to hear um, the conspiracy theories that abound from Labor. But they have a short, a short memory because I think it was only last week in Council they were 
asked me whether Ross Vaster would be the councillor for Chandler Ward. Um, so, you know, look, they, they, they can try all of the conspiracy theories they like. Um, the reality is what we have here are two absolute advocates for local residents who will do a fantastic job and uh, looking forward to working with them both in their uh, new respective roles. Thank you. I'll now put item B and C. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. All right. Thank you. I'll draw your attention to the Public and Active Transport Committee. Councillor Wyndham. No. Oh, sorry. Hang on. My notes here. <laughs> Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 7th of May 2019, be adopted. Second that, Mr Chair. All Chairman. right. I just, I, just, I just wanted you to be ready. That was all. <laughs> all right. Moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Wyndham, the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee being dated Tuesday, the 7th of May 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Last week's committee presentation was on the Bus Stop Accessibility Improvement Program, and it is exciting to see our DDA compliance continuing to roll out across our bus stops, um, looking at a completion of this full suite by the end of 2022. Uh, we have obligations under the Disability Discrimination Act, and with more than 6,000 active bus stops in Brisbane, this has not been a small program. We realise there are 4,000 of these identified needing an upgrade, and we're on track to ensure 66 per cent compliance of the network before the end of this financial year and, as I said, by 100 per cent by 2022. Um, I know that my local area has got a plethora of bus stops being done locally at the moment and it is doing wonders for my residents, whether they are in wheelchairs, young mothers with prams, uh, temporarily disabled like Councillor McLaughlin that joined us this morning or any of the above. Um, they have, uh, we've Sorry, got five. Councillors. Please just keep uh, chats among yourself to a minimum, please, and, and allow the speaker silence. Thank you. Guess what, Adam? We have five construction packages that have been awarded this financial year, meaning 450 bus stops will be receiving an upgrade. It can be something really simple like just making sure the signage is facing the right way or installing tactiles on the ground as well. But on top of this, we're also having the rolling program of our ferry terminals to make sure that everybody has access to our public transport right across Brisbane. Next week, we will be looking at the Guy Park ferry terminal closing for upgrade and construction, and we continue to make sure that Brisbane is the most accessible city in, Brisbane, in Australia. For the debate, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Listen, I'm just going to uh, briefly speak in regards to this uh, program, the Accessibility Improvement Program. Um, listen, I've had a number of uh, bus stops upgraded in my uh, ward as well, and I've had uh, pretty good feedback from, the, uh, from the, um, my constituents in regards to these. Um, a lot of them uh, weren't able to uh, access uh, access the buses, I suppose, uh, with, in wheelchairs and, and also on some of the walkers as well. It was very difficult. So they are uh, very appreciative of that. Uh, but there's one uh, issue that they do have, and that is that uh, they feel that the bus shelters, uh, uh, which, which is something that they would uh, dearly love to have, uh, especially on inbound buses, um, that, uh, that uh, a number of these uh, upgrades didn't include a shelter. Now, I know that uh, the ones that did uh, get the upgrade that already had shelters, they were put back, of course, uh, which was great. Uh, but um, I, I just recently saw one just out on um, Joseph Banks that had just been done. Uh, it had all the, uh, all the, um, the compliant um, uh, facilities and, and, and specifications undertaken. And it looks really good, except that there, it's out in the middle of um, a big green verge um, uh, on uh, on uh, Sir Joseph on, on Joseph Banks, uh, and uh, you're really out in the open. Uh, you're in the sun. You're in the rain if it rains, and uh, and of course people in wheelchairs, of course, don't have the option of able-bodied people to just maybe scurry off and get out of the rain until the bus arrives, or in some cases go across the road where there is a bus shelter. Right, and and st sit under there or stand under there until the bus arrives, and then you zip across the road. So I would just uh, hope that um, uh, the, of the 400 the 400 odd um, uh, upgrades that are going to occur uh, that the uh, chair has uh, told us about, and in the near future that. 
uh, many of those, if not all of those, could be considered uh, to uh, have a shelter installed for them. Because I just think that uh, it is part of the compliance, um, uh, uh, the compliance um, um, issues that uh, have been uh, shown in the in the report here, um, and 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 it just says shelter. So uh, I don't know why. They aren't uh, actually, I, I suppose it costs a lot of money, of course, to put a shelter up, but I don't think that's something that we should, uh, we should um, stand, stand away from. We should actually in, embrace that and uh, use some of maybe that's some of that spare money uh, that we spend on very large projects uh, around Brisbane uh, to look after the, some of the most vulnerable people in our community, those people uh, that have mobility issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First speakers. Councillor Wynne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise to speak on the item regarding to bus shelters and the VDA compliance too. As we found out last week in the chamber that I'm, uh, I have close connections with uh, the person that works within PT. And the reason he works there, of course, is because he was unable to apply for the job that really is his passion as a Queensland Rail driver, because they just won't allow people to apply from outside of Queensland Rail. But anyway, back to the subject. I travel fairly frequently on these buses and I do see what goes on with access, etc., on and off buses for disabled people. Now, you might say, yeah, I've been here a while, but when I first came into this place, very few of the buses were air conditioned which is not really good for disabled people in wheelchairs that are struggling in the first place. And you had to book a bus. If you're in a wheelchair, you had to book a bus to come out to, the, to pick you up. They had to make sure they had particular buses on that service so as they could pick up disabled people because there was a limited number of buses that had ramps or were kneeling buses to pick people up. We've come a long way since then. We're going through a program of making bus stops compliant. Now, I just heard from the other side of the chamber that we could be spending some money on shelters on these bus stops. But I didn't hear any suggestion that perhaps you'd asked your local council officers or the chair to install a shelter. It's not difficult. You just talk to the chair or you talk to your local officers. Because several of our bus stops or many of our bus stops aren't even council owned, the shelters. I've even asked to have old shelters shifted to where there aren't shelters. Councillors will be heard So my silence. suggestion would be to just ask. After all, asking and you will receive. Further speakers. <laughs> Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Windham and Councillor Strunk, for your contribution. It was explained last week that, yes, in these DDA um, compliance upgrades, that if they have a shelter, that the shelters are upgraded as well. If you require new shelters that are not already on the, uh, at the bus stop, it is a different line item within the budget that deals with new shelters, and they are prioritised definitely towards the inbound stops. Um, the uh, officers told us, but it's also across 6,000 bus stops. There's got to be some priority across the city as well. But more than happy, councillors, if you've got stops that you're interested in that you think may have the capacity or the need on the usage for a bus shelter across the priority of citywide, happy to hear your suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Adams. I will now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Councillor Cooper, the Infrastructure Committee, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 7th of May 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Huang, uh, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee dated Tuesday, the 7th of May 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cooper. 
Uh, very briefly, uh, Mr Chair, we had a presentation, uh, we actually had two presentations at committee last week, uh, one on autonomous vehicles and the autonomous vehicle trial in our network. Uh, so there has been a lot of work uh, that has been undertaken across the city uh, and obviously it is something that will require significant changes to the way uh, our road network works and uh, how federal legislation deals with some of these challenges, particularly relating to insurance and those sorts of things. So there has been uh, a trial undertaken by Transurban. Uh, there was the report that Transurban produced and we talked about that uh, and talked about some of the challenges uh, that uh, were the outcome of that particular trial. It was very interesting. There was quite a bit of discussion uh, amongst the committee members about uh, the future uh, and the degree of autonomy that already exists in our vehicles on the road, as well as other uh, freight movements that are undertaken, particularly at the port and things like that. So it was interesting. Uh, and we also did a presentation on our award-winning SAM initiative and specifically talked about the Easter SAM campaign. So um, these campaigns have been uh, very well received by the community and uh, certainly are things that we will be looking to continue uh, in future. Uh, I particularly would like to say that uh, I would like to thank Councillor Peter Cumming for his contribution as a member of the Infrastructure Committee. Uh, he certainly participated every week in discussions uh, and uh, made some very uh, cogent points. So I thank, his, thank him for his contribution uh, and uh, also would like to I know he, he's going to miss us um, very much, uh, and uh, I, I appreciate the sentiment. Thank you very much. Uh, but we've got now two new members for our committee with Councillor Johnston and uh, Councillor James Mackay. So uh, welcome to Councillor Mackay. Uh, it is his first committee, and I'm sure that he's looking for it to be a very enjoyable experience, and I hope that that is the case. Now, there are a couple of questions after committee last week about SAM data. So uh, since 2013, there's been reports that have been uh, processed and prepared and saved for each sign location. So at the end of 16, the 16, 17 uh, financial year, the team spoke to all councillors about their respective ward programs uh, and the data reports. So all councillors officers advised me were um, happy to agree that they would request data reports when they wanted them. So uh, I am advised that in May 2018 that there was a summary of data provided to all 26 councillors in both soft and hard copy for all SAM signs and the LED road signs for their ward. Now at committee this morning I made the comment uh, to the committee members that if councillors would prefer a different format then that is absolutely um, fine uh, if they could just convey that to the officers as to how they would like to get that information provided to them. Uh, it will be provided as, as they seek it to be provided, uh, just if they could um, certainly provide feedback to the team. If they want to get every single, uh, every single piece of data at, you know, immediately or if they want to get it at, in a sort of a six monthly batch or whatever they would seek to have, then we are happy to get the officers to facilitate that. There were some questions about um, move safe. So Councillor Johnson uh, had um, asked about Oxley Road. Uh, I understood she had been briefed and I've just confirmed with the officers that she was personally briefed on this safety initiative on the 20th of November 2018 uh, and council distributed a letter to local traders and affected businesses on the 5th of December. December 2018. So also on via questions on notice on the 5th of March 2019, uh, Councillor Johnston was advised that the local speed management committee supported the speed reduction on the 21st of January 2019. So uh, Councillor Johnston, uh, I conveyed it this morning that we are finalising um, these works. So there will be that, uh, uh, that will be happening and she'll be provided with a briefing note uh, so that she has all of those details uh, for her as the local councillor. Uh, of course, just as we did with Anne Street, there will be a seven day advisory period prior to that speed reduction to make sure that we give road users advance notice of the speed reduction. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. For the speakers, Councillor Johnston. Yes, I just rise to speak on item B, the uh, SAM signage. Uh, and can I just say, um, Certainly, we talk on a regular basis with the officers about um, SAM and LED data. Um, and 
you know, it, it's about a year ago they told us they would not be providing the data anymore, and I'm saying, like, hang on a minute, we want the data. We tell people about it. We share it. Um, it's of great interest to the community where the hotspots are. Um, and I can say that whilst we often discuss the priority locations, I don't believe we were ever advised that you were going to stop providing the data to councillors. Um, and my question uh, last week to Councillor Cooper was, why was it stopped being sent out to, some uh, to all councillors automatically, as had been done for the first, I don't know, three years? Councillor Cooper actually said um, that it was because some councillors didn't want the data. Who are they? Who are they? Who are the councillors that are not interested in the results of these signs that have told council officers or Councillor Cooper that they don't want the data? Because if they don't want the data, they don't want the signs, and those signs should be rotated back out to other wards where the councillors show an interest. Now, Councillor Cooper's also just said that these signs are well received in the community. I would completely agree with that. They are working well. It's been a good initiative. Um, but apparently some councillors don't believe that to be the case. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in who's saying they don't want to know what's going on. And if they don't want to know what's going on, Councillor Cooper, through you, Mr Chairman, I would say um, if they're not interested in this program any longer, I most definitely am. I will have their signs. I will rotate them around my ward. Um, and we are interested in the data and sharing it with the police and sharing it with the schools and sharing it with the community to try and encourage people to slow down, um, particularly in the hot spots uh, around schools in my ward um, and on main roads where there are uh, safety issues. Um, so I was just, I, I just I can't say anything on Move Safe now, but I might do that later. But uh, uh, if this program is being well received in the community, my question is which councillors aren't receiving it well? Further speakers, Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just rise to speak on the infrastructure uh, committee report on both uh, A and A and B. Uh, Councillor Cooper already gave the chamber a very comprehensive report on the uh, on the committee. But uh, I would just like to add that uh, I was um, asked to represent the law mayor at the uh, National Road Safety Week event during the Labor Day long weekend. And uh, the issue of automated uh, system has been raised uh, briefly in that, in that event. And I had the chance to meet with a gentleman called um, uh, Mr. Lachlan McIntosh, who's the president of Australasian College of Road Safety. And we had a, an in-depth discussion about automated uh, vehicles. And uh, of course, we can do the best infrastructure for, um, for, for, for these vehicles and uh, do the best preparation for our city. But after all, I think um, we have both agreed that it is the human driver behavior that is actually causing the problem. So um, of course, we can do the best in, in our infrastructure. But I think you know, human behavior is ultimately something we are dealing with. And that is probably something we have to prepare for. And I understand this trial is going to um, um, take few years. I think it will finish by 2022, and uh, hopefully um, these human factors will be taken into consideration. And uh, I also like to raise about um, Sam, and uh, I understand Easter, um, the Easter Sam is a great success, and as all councillors agree that he has been received well by the community. So uh, I think we actually raise that maybe um, councillors can make some mission about what sort of Sam they want in the coming month. I actually thought you know, Halloween may be a good theme for Sam, as long as it makes people aware of uh, drive, you know, drive, drivers uh, driving safely. I think um, it, we should open to all these suggestions. And uh, Councillor Toomey actually raised about a state of origin. I don't know how, how we can do that. Maybe we can change to different colors, but that's definitely something worth looking into. Uh, but um, I think you know, it, it is a very uh, workable and positive program for our city. And I'm sure that Councillor Cooper will be happy to take in any suggestions of what kind of SAM we should have um, in the coming month. Thank you. Other speakers? Right reply, Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, Mr Chair, I thank Councillor Huang for his contribution. Uh, I think that the comments that were made uh, are not a reflection at all on what I said. I said that councillors have the opportunity to choose how or how frequently they choose to get the information about the SAM signs. I have yet to meet one single councillor who has ever 
said to me that they do not want a SAM sign or multiple SAM signs. In fact, there are no councillors that have only one SAM sign. So if you have more than one, um, I would suggest that you are a strong advocate for the program. And I have yet to have any councillor advise me to the contrary. So that was a gross misrepresentation of the situation. And I would just like particularly to say this is an initiative. It was started under the Lord Mayor when he was Deputy Mayor. It is a program that I think has been tremendously successful, and it is a program that we will continue to support because of the benefit that are, benefits that are derived for the residents of Brisbane. And it is, in fact, a positive message. It's a message of encouraging people to do the right thing instead of being punitive and fining them for speeding. While, of course, if they're doing the wrong thing, they are, of course, uh, potentially incurring a fine. This is a great way to get people to think differently about moving around in our local communities. And I am incredibly proud of what we've been able to do uh, working with our communities. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Councillor Allen. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for dinner for a period of one hour, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. <coughs> Excuse me. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Richards, that this, uh, that this council adjourn for a period of one hour, commencing when all councillors have left the chamber. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Yeah. The ayes have it. We are now uh, adjourned. <laughs>